The point came where the first six, seven months, I lost around like a like hundred and two, hundred three thousand. You know, all my savings gone. You know, everything that we've saved for me and my wife all gone. I sat on the bench and I started crying. Welcome everyone to another Words of Wisdom podcast. We are here for our biggest podcast to date and we're here in Dubai trying to embrace the culture. Uh, but we are here with our biggest podcast, very, very humbled, the founder of Magic Keys, the founder of Dominion Markets and the founder of SRC and Market Fluidity, Mr. Raja Banks. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you for that humble introduction. <laughs> it's my pleasure. I've been practicing, as you know. <laughs> Not sure if I needed it, but thank, thanks, man. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. it. We've yeah. got, we got to get the people engaged. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's it. I'm trying to learn about you know, YouTube and podcasts, and you know, there's a lot that goes into it that I had no idea about. I thought you'd just sit and talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, m mostly, I think it's just about, I think, sitting and talking, mm -hmm. just like that, I think it's great. But like, you know, that way you get some more ideas com coming in and one conversation leads to another one and another one. And before you know it, you're looking at the time, you're like, yeah, we may be up on time, you know. So, that's it, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's when you have a, a great conversation, you know. And I think they're very rare nowadays, you know. That's true. We got, especially, I'm guilty for it, you know, the phones are always in the way or business is always in the way. There's always something. Yeah. So it's quite rare. I think podcasts are pretty much one of the only times where people sit and just talk. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Because like organic conversation is just gone. Yeah. There's no such thing as organic conversation, right? You sit with your family, you're still on your phone, da da da. Someone yeah. said this, someone said that. But yeah, you're right. Like podcasts like this, this is like, I think this is going to be the longest conversation <laughs> we will ha have as yeah. two individuals. Yeah, probably. No doubt <laughs> exactly. About it, honestly. And uh, again, though, I'm very, very humbled that you, you know, agreed to come on the podcast. I know that we. I think I first tagged you in back in December yeah. and uh, I was coming to buy in January and you were leaving at the end of December. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I've missed that opportunity. And then this time I was here and I saw you were here. And not only that, I remember you posted in the one hotel and I was at that same hotel. Yeah. And I was like, okay, small world. I'll try again. <laughs> and you had to go, but you know, the stars have aligned and fate has brought us together. And again, thank you for coming because I know that in terms of, in terms of like audience, right? It's not like I have a big audience for you, so like it's a it's a very it's an honor really to to have you with us today. And um, I guess we'll get started. Normally, how I start is I know a lot of people probably know your journey, okay. uh, but we'll just start with a very quick overview. You know how you got into trading, sort of your journey up until now, and uh, we'll take it from there. No doubt. Yeah, like uh, bro, my trading journey it it all started by accident, hmm. right? So back in twenty um, twenty sixteen. Well, actually 2015, we were running a sales office, right? So what we were doing was we were training agents to mm -hmm. go to door to door and sell stuff, right? Really high ticket items. And, and the whole thing was that, you know, the amount of doors that you're going to knock, yeah. then you're going to have the probability of talking to clients. When mm -hmm. you talk to clients, let's say you knock on 100 doors, you're going to talk to, let's say, 50 people, yeah. right? Out of those 50 people, maybe two or three are going to buy. Right. So that was all what we did. So we had a, like a big office. We had a, we had around like 40, 50 agents, you know, and um, this one day this agent comes to me. His name is Austin. He's probably going to be watching this as well. <laughs> oh, he came to me and he's like, hey, Raja, look at this. Look at this. This is this is MetaTrader. And look, I'm making eight hundred dollars. And this is amazing. I looked at it and I'm like, oh, great. Perfect. We got a meeting to attend. So. Um, so long story short, what happened was now um, I was one of the managers, right? Yeah. Me, it was me and my other friend. So uh, we had a lot of downtime. So during that downtime, you know, you're scrolling to Instagram, and Facebook, YouTube, and whatever. And I'm scrolling to Instagram, and I see this guy. He's pulling like three, four thousand a day. Mm. You know, like the same MetaTrader screenshot. He's posting it, and then he has another post where he's done a sixty-five thousand withdrawal mm. from MetaTrader. And I'm like. What the hell is this? Because <laughs> like back then I'm making like maybe like 250 to 300k a year. Yeah. So in my mind I was like, yeah, I'm the big shot, right? But yeah. I'm looking at this someone who's making way more, spending less time working. So that got me interested. I'm like, what's going on here? Like, there's maybe something I'm doing wrong. Yeah. You know, because once you look at people who are doing more than you, mm -hmm. right? There, there are two things you can think. Right. First thing is you can say that oh, you know, maybe he's doing something unethical. Or maybe he's doing something wrong or whatever, right? Yeah. The second way is you look at that and you're like, okay, how can I do that? How can I get to that same level? Mm -hmm. And um, 
the name of that Instagram page was Uncle Ted. Yeah. <laughs> it was Uncle Ted. So I messaged him. I'm like, hey, uh, what are you doing? What's this Forex thing? This is in 2016, mm -hmm. February. Uh, what's this Forex thing? And he told me, this is what it is. You got to open an account on a brokerage. I'm like, what's a brokerage? You know, and I'm like, okay, where did you open your account? He's like, oh, I opened my account at IC Markets. I'm like, okay. So I opened my account at IC Markets. I loaded $200. And within a week, I lost that money. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't know what I was doing. Of course. You know, so, so I lost that money. And at that point, I realized that it's absolute madness to try to make money from something you don't know mm. or something you don't understand. You know, and during that time, I think around it was May, um, he was having this um, mentorship intake thing, right? It was like about $350, $400 something, you know. So at that time, that was still a lot of money to me. Of course. You know, so I was like, okay, I'm going to pay this guy this money and maybe I'm going to learn something from that. And I paid him. He lived maybe like 30 minutes away. And I told him, bro, listen, if this is a scam, <laughs> I know where you live. You're in the same, you're in the same municipality. I'm going to come find you. He, yeah. he, he's like, oh, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. That's totally fine. It's all cool. Like, you know, so, yeah. so uh, that's where it started. I did that boot camp. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we were in a group and we were posting every day. We were doing private Zoom sessions. And that's how the journey started. That's how I started. Well, it's yeah. a great journey. And it's, it's interesting you say, because I know that in terms of the trading journey, that's where it started. But in terms of your mindset towards you know success and, yeah. and building sort of a bigger life, was that the start of that from trading as well? Or did you sort of have that mindset before that also? Um, I've basically, I always knew that there's something more to life. Mm. I always knew that, right? I had family friends who had a lot of money. Mm. I had family friend who uh, ran a collections agency. Oh, nice. And uh, I remember he bought an R8. Mm. You know, this is back in 2014. 24, yeah, 2014. He bought an R8. And I was like, wow, this car is like over $100,000, you know? So back then, like, you know, when, you, when you're fresh out of school, mm. the only car you can afford to get is like maybe... 30,000 or 40,000 max, mm. you know, like a Honda, Toyota, Kia, whatever. You know, this guy got an Audi and this guy, I know him. He's a family friend. So I'm like, that's interesting, you know? So, and, and, and he told me, he told me that the only reason I got this car was to maybe motivate somebody that you don't need to be 50 or 60 years old yeah. or even 40 to have something like this. Mm -hmm. You can be in your early thirties. You can be in your late twenties and have a car like that. So, I always knew that there was there's there's something more, you know. So what I did was after I uh, dropped out of university, um, started working on the rigs and all that. Um, working on the rigs was interesting from the point that it was great money, but you were spending a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, making that money. So when I came back home to Ontario, um, I had a few friends who were working in the sales, right? And sales they were making more money, mm -hmm. spending less time. So I think that's where. It was fed into my brain that, okay, I think the, the best way to climb the ladder of success or to be where you want to be is or to be where you think people should be is by make enough but spend as little time as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and like our family has a business background and like, you know, my father always told, told me, hey, like, you know, you want to make money, you got to go into business mm -hmm. no matter what. You know, my father, father-in-law, uh, may God bless his soul, he also said, um, uh, before he passed away, he kept saying, business is the only way. Business is the only way. It's hard, but once you go through it, once you make it, it's so much rewarding. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, what's very interesting there is obviously, I know that in terms of coming out of university and everything, that you'd actually, I didn't realize this myself. I had like suspicions, if you will, but you know, in terms of I had no idea that you'd actually grown up quite a long time in Pakistan. Yeah. And then moved to Canada. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to tell. It's only because I watched your podcast with Alex G that I realized, oh, that's a very interesting part of the story. But so because you actually were were you like a teenager, maybe early twenties at the time? We moved to Canada when I was twenty five. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So pure pindy boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I was gonna say. So like your your environment was very different. You know, I I would imagine in Pakistan, right? Yeah. So in terms of your environment back there, was it still quite wholesome quite you know being able to take in quite a lot in terms of success and entrepreneurship or was did that really start as you moved over to canada well to be honest bro um when we were in pakistan now when you're living in pakistan right mm -hmm. you're living you're not 
independent. Mm-hmm. You're still dependent on your parents. Yeah. You know, and I was still dependent on them till I was 23, 24. You know, because it's it's like the it's the culture that you go to university. Once you're going to university, you yeah. can't get a job while you're in university. Mm-hmm. Well, you can as freelance work and whatnot. But like back in 2010, 20, um, 2008, 2009 and 2010, freelancing wasn't as much as it is here. Now, uh, yeah, it's available. Now, right. Yeah. So so there was nothing like that. And uh, my father, he took a big risk. You know, what he did was his whole plan was to move the family to Canada, mm-hmm. a place where we knew nobody, you know, and out of all the places, we moved to Prince Edward Island. <laughs> yeah, you know where that is? I do. I do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we moved to Prince Edward Island, this small town of 100,000 people over there. We didn't know anyone, you know, so that's a big risk he took saying that, OK, you, you know what? So he told me his plan is to, like, move the entire family, mm. get residency, Hopefully get passports. Hopefully everyone can graduate. Except me, I didn't graduate. <laughs> Hopefully everyone can graduate. And then like, you know, they can start their own life. So that was his whole grand plan. Mm-hmm. And man, I still tell him to this day that your move that you made to get this big risk you took, you took, this has changed the course of our entire generation. Definitely. Like of my kids, their kids, kids. So, so yeah, like we moved to Canada when I was 25 and, um, got in a job over there and my whole thing was that okay you know what as an immigrant i have to show that i can do better than mm-hmm. the people who are already living over there okay yeah that was the whole mindset so is that this uh, competitive edge if you will oh yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah. because bro like when you immigrate to some place you immigrate with nothing mm. absolutely nothing so the hunger to succeed it's there yeah if it's not there then you're gonna get caught up in the rat race and the whole i mean yeah, I I wasn't cut out for that. So, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, well, was it uh, a very motivating factor or sort of eye opening to see something you know, at 25, see your dad take such a risk as well for the whole family? Was it sort of, sort of like an understanding that in life there's going to be some major risks, some like moments where you don't know if it's going to succeed or not, but you have to take it? Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think at that time I didn't really understand that. Mm. I didn't really understand the risk he was taking because because Canada was new to me, mm. right? It was new to me. There was like there was like a lot of like things there which weren't in Pakistan. Of course. Yeah. So when you're exposed to certain things which you only saw on TV, mm. then you get lost in that environment. Yeah. Right. And and that's what really happened to me the first two three years. I hurt my parents a lot during that time. I did yeah. some stuff I probably shouldn't have done, mm-hmm. but. Um, I didn't really quite understand the struggle until I moved out to work on the oil rigs mm. where I had to sleep in my car for a month. <laughs> then I understood that, okay, the kind of risk my dad took, yeah. you know, and, and, and the trajectory where my life is headed at this point. So I think I, so I tell these, uh, so like, you know, recently I have some people message me, they're like, you know, in their early 20s, uh, mm-hmm. late teens, mm-hmm. and they talk to me about Forex, yeah. you know, investing. And I'm like, guys, listen, you're in your early 20s. If you know the information regarding Forex and business and entrepreneurship, you're way ahead of me. Yeah. Because I didn't quite understand that till I was like 26, 27. Yeah. So I'm, I, I was late to the party. <laughs> you guys are early to the party. That's it, yeah. Because that's what I say. I say to people as well the same thing. It's like you have so much time. Because at that age, I understand. Because I remember being at that age, you think you know everything that there yeah. is to know. So then they are very quick to say, I'm going to quit this job. Or I'm going to quit this university and I'm just going to go all in with Forex. So they have that lack of understanding of the actual journey of trading is, itself already. That's true. But, uh, but as you say, that in terms of the blessing of finding something like this so early, they don't realize it at the time. And that's why the patience is, is so key for them. Um, and it's very interesting you say about you know that risk. You didn't understand it at the time. And I remember you mentioning on the uh, Alex G podcast that, you know, when you first went out and did the oil rigs work, you didn't have a job. It didn't really work out. And then you ended up going to Pakistan. You ended up meeting your wife. And then when you came back, that's when you kind of made it work. Would you say the responsibility of getting married and having a partner like that, uh, you sort of kind of pushed you, you know, and made you sort of realize in terms of respon- Yeah, As you said, you didn't really understand the risk. Yeah. But then now that you have essentially, especially in our culture, the responsibility now of some another person rather than just yourself. Was that something that kind of pushed you, made you grow? Made you be more aware of those things? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because because after I got married, I understood that now there's someone in my life mm. who is 110% the 
dependent on me, mm-hmm. right? Because now there's a someone who's been taken care of by the brothers, by the father, by mm-hmm. the family, but now it's all on me. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that triggers something in your mind. I think so. And I tell this to people all the time now, like, you know, now I got kids, right? Now the responsibility is tenfold. Yeah. You know, so there's no room for error. There's no margin where I can say, okay, like, you know, maybe I can, I can maybe not do a certain thing mm-hmm. which needs to be done till tomorrow no it has to be done now yeah because if i don't do that then maybe there's something on my table that may be kept missing from my kids or from mm-hmm. my wife you know so so 100 like um after we got together and she moved to canada and she started to live with me i really understood that okay you know what i gotta i gotta make it mm-hmm. somehow i have to make it work definitely and uh, yeah. you know you can tell from your journey that that's kind of where it started from there you know, I think from there, you then obviously came across a sales job and heard about the sales. And I definitely always say that sales itself is a skill set, regardless of whether you want to go into sales or not, or whether you become an entrepreneur. I think sales itself in terms of skill set really improves an individual because there's so much that goes into it. And as you talked about earlier, in terms of probability, in terms of transitioning that into trading, it's such a powerful thing because it's the exact same thing. You know, you it's like 100 trades mm. and then this is your strike rate. It's the same with sales, right? So, you know, when you did go over and start that sales job, was it, in terms of skill set, was that really a massive improvement? Because obviously I would imagine the oil rigs was very manual labor type. Yeah, yeah man. As sales was, uh, I'm not, not naturally, mm. I wasn't a good speaker. Okay. I wasn't a good speaker. I had a problem with uh, stuttering, mm-hmm. a major problem. So that affected my confidence a lot. Definitely. I didn't make any sales the first two months. You know, I'd go home and like I'd, I'd leave home at around 8 a.m. And I would come back home at about 8 p.m. You know, I did that for two months. Mm. Two months. Imagine you're going out, you're knocking on doors, you can't speak, you can't pitch because you got a conference issue, you know, and, and, and people don't take you seriously. You're coming home. And your family's there and they're saying, oh, hey, did you make any sales today? Any sales today? No sales today. And then they're like, oh, you shouldn't have left your job and this and that. You're, you're getting consistent income. Before sales, I was working in a factory. Mm. You know, there has been times where, where I've had no money. Mm. There have been times I've had no money. Then there have been times I've had money. You know, so from a factory, I left that. And my dad was super happy. He was happy that, okay, you know what? Thank God you got in a nice car factory to make the parts and this and that. Just stick to it. You're going to become a supervisor. Because the thing is, like, the parents, they always look out for you. Yeah. You know, no matter what it is, they don't want you to struggle. That's the thing, you know. And, and, and that comes out of love. Mm. So one month in sales, you know, they're like, hey, you should go back to the job, man. Like, I mean, it's tough. It's tough. I'm like, no, I'm going to make it because I saw... Uh, sales agents working with us and they were making great money Mm -hmm. they were getting sales so i'm like i have to make it work and i think after um a month and a half i got my first sale. well two months after i got my first sale and bro i was so happy i was so happy that was the point i made like 1400 dollars. i walked outside the home now i walked outside of the home it was raining a little bit there was a bench right across the street the bus stop bench right Mm -hmm. i sat on the bench and i started crying I was like, man, this is done. Mm. I did it once. And that point, I understood this one thing about sales, right? It's all about the odds of probabilities. You know, like, I mean, you knock on 100 doors. It's the same thing. 100 doors, 20 people, two sales. Yeah. That's the formula that I had in my mind. And I knew that if I can do this once, I can do it a million times over. Mm-hmm. Then third month, I made uh, 10,000. Fourth month, fourth month, I made... Fourth month, in one week, I made 10000 in commissions. And that was the trajectory where I knew, okay, you know what? Sales, 100%. Important for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's incredible, no? And it, it's, you know, it just shows the perseverance. And one thing I want to just pivot towards, as you mentioned about you know, the family, and it's, yeah. a, it's a big thing because, as you can imagine, no doubt you've had so many messages, you know, people saying about, my friends don't support me, my mom doesn't support me, my dad doesn't support me, they're telling me not to trade, they don't believe in my trading, they want me to go to university, all of the usual uh, things that we hear, and it's very common. And I feel like sometimes people build that resentment, you know, towards mm. their parents, towards yeah. their friends. But as you said, touched upon there, it's very important. Factors. They hate me, they don't want me to succeed. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. And don't get me wrong, there might be certain elements where yeah. parents... You know, lo- lo- normally it's the lack of understanding, of course, yes. you know, because a lot of people are in that nine to five or into that normal sort of route, right? Education, nine to five, work your way up the ladder. And therefore, in terms of entrepreneurship and especially trading, they don't understand what it is and what is required. So as you say, it's coming from a place of love 
and a lack of awareness. And being from our culture, um, you know, a lot of sort of emphasis is put onto education, right? Education. And I understand why. There was a point when I was younger, I didn't understand why. I just mm-hmm. thought, you know, just because you did that, why should I do that? But as you say, it's about love. It's about understanding that you can do this. I know you have a safety net at least, right? Yeah. And But with yourself, obviously, as you said, you didn't graduate. So how was that? How was that? Because I know that you mentioned as well that when you came to Canada, there was a lot of, you know, you did some things that upset. And, you know, I've done some things too. And I understand that it's part of the journey, right? It's part yeah. of the journey. And a large part of it is because of the environment as well. Um, and sometimes I think it's necessary to grow, to understand yourself. But how, how was that for you? Because obviously from our culture, going through that period as well, you're moving from a completely different environment to then a, a more Western society as well. Yeah. How was that for you? It must have yeah, been it was. Uh, it was. Uh, so, so, so I did my university in Pakistan. Did mm-hmm. about three and a half, uh, no, six and a half, seven and a half semesters. Mm-hmm. I forgot how many semesters there are in a bachelor's program. Yeah, seven and a half. I had one semester left to graduate. Mm-hmm. Moved to Canada. Uh, they accept one semester, right? They accept one semester, and um, I'm like, okay. And then my course coordinator or whatever that person's called, they're like, well, it's going to take you three more years. So I'm like, three more years? Okay, three and a half plus three. It's like three, six, six and six and a half years to graduate. Mm-hmm. Then my youngest sister, she was coming in university. And she's coming in university. And I'm thinking, I'm like, this can't happen. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. My brother has graduated. You know, he moved to a different province. He graduated. Oh, wow. yeah. And I still got two and a half years left when she's coming in and and the way my studies are going, she's probably going to graduate before me, <laughs> you know? So so uh, so I, I had to come clean. I had to come clean and there have been a lot of events in, in my life that I had to come clean about a lot of stuff. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people don't come clean about stuff they should be coming clean about. Yeah. You know, so I went to my dad's store and um, I told him, hey, I, I mean, um, I'm going to leave university. He's like, why? <laughs> Um, then I told him, like, you know, what, what I was thinking, what mm-hmm. was happening in me, like mentally and all that. He's like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm going to go to Alberta and I'm going to work in the oil patch and make money. He's like, and then, and then I started crying, you know, I started crying and he started crying with me. And it was just a very, very emotional moment, mm-hmm. you know, because, because, I mean, you're a father and your firstborn, you know, is just crushed under certain like you know certain like rules of cultures and all that and uh, and uh, and at that point he understood what i really wanted you know and i said hey like you know what don't worry about it if 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 nothing happens i'm going to come back to university and then and i never came back to university <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's it it's very interesting though cuz uh you know at the end of the day it takes as you say coming clean mm-hmm. you know and i feel like a lot of people they have this pressure you know, culturally and sometimes from their parents as well, but in a, in a loving way even. But they never speak their mind, you know. They never actually speak their truth, if you will, and how they're actually feeling. And therefore, they will just try and suffer and then they build that resentment. Was it a case where, you know, because you spoke and you had that sort of moment, was it much easier then to do that in the future as well? So like by opening that door once, was it easier to do in the future? Or was it sort of still a bit of a, a rocky road, if you will, a bit of a hardship to kind of say... I'm, you know, you're going to try this or struggling with this. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's it 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 most of it comes from the fact that trying to prove people wrong. Mm-hmm. That's where it comes from, you know. Because um, and and the one major thing thing is no matter what I did after, like you know, working on oil rigs, mm-hmm. I never told anyone what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, and that's where guys say, oh, you know, people don't support me, your friends don't support me. They don't need to know what you're doing. They don't need to know you're trading. They don't need to know your well. They need to know you're working part time and then you're trading part time. They don't need to know your hobbies mm. because a lot of times when we think about things, when we want to do certain stuff, we're thinking about those stuff from our perspective. Mm. You know, and you got to understand, our parents they have their own perspective. Yeah. They are their own person. You know, your siblings they're very very different. You know, blood is blood. That's fine, but blood still flows like water. Everyone's totally different. Yeah. You know, your friends they're also totally different. So no one's ever going to understand your perspective. So that's why I tell guys, like, hey, listen, if someone doesn't support you, why is that? Why are you even telling them what you're doing? Mm. You know, because they're not going to understand what you're doing other than you yourself. You know, so um, I started trading. No one knew I was trading. Mm. Nobody knew. Absolutely no one. They All they knew was that, okay, he has this online hobby, which we don't understand. Mm-hmm. And that's it. You know, and and, and uh, one more thing. I think I think people feel resentment 
towards uh, their loved ones. If their loved ones see that this guy is totally involved in this one thing yeah. for the whole day. You know, so if you structure your hobbies, let's say working out or trading, whatever, if you structure them for like, let's say two hours a day, three hours a day, then they're going to respect your time because they'll know, okay, you know what, this time he's doing whatever the hell he's doing, that's totally fine. But then he has nothing to do. He's like, you know, maybe helping us out or going to the job or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, like they don't need to know what you're doing. <laughs> you it's know? true. I think, uh, you know, we're guilty, especially with social media, so guilty of just trying to constantly share you know, constantly tell others, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Even if it's just like a holiday. Yeah. I'm going on a holiday. I'm uh, I'm buying a new car. I'm buying, I've got a pet, you know. Um, so I completely understand what you're, you're talking about there. And I think, especially in trading, I think a lot of people are very quick to try and document the journey, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's my charts. Here's my routine. Here's my journal. Oh, I'm journaling this. Here are my losses. And I do understand that there is a great element of accountability from doing so. Right, and documenting your journey. But I feel like so much people put more weight and pressure onto that rather than acquiring the skill set first. That's true. Um, that they kind of put pressure on themselves that they don't need to have pressure on. Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm showing this, or I need to make sure I post today when yeah. that energy needs to be here over the here in the trading to get those results. Um, so it's a very great point because you know, a lot of people do complain about it. Like I've, I've been guilty of it before myself. Like, oh, my family don't support me in, in, in shouting out my, in my podcast, you know, or yeah. whatever. Then I realized like it doesn't need to. Like, that's, that's not their job. You know, their job isn't to do that. At the end of the day, as you say, like your biggest supporters will be those who are essentially strangers or you've never met, right? Because they're, they, they share your perspective in trading, for example. So like with mm -hmm. the pod, why would my family who don't really understand trading, why would they share my podcast or watch my podcast? Because they're not really going to get much from it, really, yeah. other than seeing my face. Yeah, <laughs> they're probably exactly. sick of already. Um, but in terms of your journey, so, you know, based on what you said, you started off as a sales rep, right? How did you, you know, th those two months? Because a lot of people, I know sales has a huge turnover rate because I've huge. done it before. I haven't done door to door. Oh. That's a whole different level. Oh, right? <laughs> telesales tele -sales is, yeah. is hard, but it's not as hard as door to door. Yeah. That is, uh, I was literally, I've said to people so many times in terms of uh, telesales, uh, no, door to door, sorry, is it's the, probably one of the hardest jobs you can do. Because the, as you said about the confidence, you know, to actually knock on someone's door. So you're at their house. They don't want you to be there already. You already know that, right? You have to knock on their door and then convince them to stay there and talk to you, right? And you have to do it in a way where in the end, you've convinced them to pay you something. The biggest thing is, mm. once you knock on someone's door, you're jumping in their life. Yeah. The guy may be going through divorce. Mm. He may be in debt. Mm -hmm. he, he maybe have payments to pay. And there you are. Hey, sir, how's it going? <laughs> and he's like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. You know? So, uh, yeah. So, it, 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 I think sales, it really built up my confidence, mm -hmm. you know, to, to talk to people, to, to basically negotiate, mm -hmm. you know. So, so, yeah, I think, for ev I think anyone who does come up or out of university or even if they're young, like I, I tell my wife all the time, like here's a young now, he's like five and three, mm -hmm. five and two. And I'm like, once they're like eight or nine, I'm going to teach them these two concepts, mm -hmm. right? The first concept is how to earn money. And the second concept is how to make money, right? Okay. You earn money by substituting your time, mm -hmm. right? You now you're going to spend four hours and four hours, you're going to get X amount of pay per hour, mm -hmm. right? And then, so let's say you got to make a thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make a thousand dollars. The first way is to make a thousand dollars is to say that, okay, you know what? I can work $10 an hour or $20 an hour. Once that time is up, I'm going to have a thousand dollars. Second thing is that you have a product which costs $20 or $50, mm -hmm. and you can sell this to anyone at any time, at any time of the day to make $1,000. Mm -hmm. Once they understand which way is easier to make the $1,000, I think they're going to be set for life, mm -hmm. 100%. Well, definitely. These are the skills that, yeah, they talk about the school doesn't teach us what we need. Yeah. And they're the skills that you have an opportunity to do so. And I think a lot of people are guilty of assuming, like especially with trading, for example, assuming that, Oh, I'm a trader, so I'm going to teach my son to trade, or my daughter to trade. <laughs> but the reality is that you, know, you need to have that passion for trading in the first place. Yeah. Once if they don't have the passion, yeah. you can teach them the skills, so they always have it. For they're example. probably going to hate it. <laughs> they, they probably <laughs> will. They're going to learn these candles. Exactly, and yeah. especially if they've watched us you know, getting gray and getting stressed and, and you yeah. know, the routine and all the, the, the journey that it took, they're, they're going to want to stay well away. But um, I, I understand the concept of it, you know, teaching. But in terms of skill set, you know, teaching about taxes, teaching about, you know, as you say, earning and making money, it's a very powerful thing. And, you know, it is something that will only set them ahead, yes. you know, massively. But in terms of that sales, those two months, those two months that, you know, it was literally zero, no sales uh, and the 12-hour 12, 12 shifts day to day. 
how did you get through that? You know, what was it that got you through that? Because at the time, obviously, you'd worked in the oil rigs, you know, so you had made good money from doing manual labor. Yeah. So you always knew that, hey, I could always go back to doing that, right? Um, that was always an option. And the factory, as you say, as well. So what was it that got you through those two months? You know, no, you know, very little, because sales jobs, they pay very little base pay, right? Uh, yeah. And people don't know. No, there was no pay. Well, zero, exactly. Some there's sales jobs. Commissions. There you go. Yeah, commission only. <laughs> and there's a lot here. You know, there's a lot of sales jobs here where yeah. it's commission only and people yeah. have to take that risk or not. So how did you do two months of no income then? Bro, it was... Uh there were people who were working with me, mm -hmm. way younger than me, mm. driving Audi A7s and R8s and like Breitling watches mm -hmm. back back then. Five thousand dollar watch, six thousand dollar watch. Back then, that was like, you bought a five thousand dollar watch, <laughs> you know? Let alone a Rolex or whatever. Yeah. Like, I mean, still five, six grand, still a lot of money. Of course, yeah. You know, and they were all younger than me. You know, and they were getting checks in front of me, like like six thousand dollar check a week, seven thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, and mm. I can't even make a dollar. You know, so watching that, I knew that if they can do it, then I can do that too, mm -hmm. because they got the same brain as me, they bleed the same way as me, they think this, they may not think the same way, but they're probably doing something different. Mm -hmm. So so, and I knew that my biggest problem was probably confidence, okay. and I had to really work on that confidence. And the best way for me to work on the confidence, because I had a little bit of an issue with my speech, yeah, was to just talk to people. Yeah, just talk and just talk go in the and deep talk. end. Yeah, and um, I used to listen to a lot of Les Brown. Yeah, a legend. Yeah. Les Brown. I used to listen to a lot of uh, Jim Ron. I still listen to uh, Les Brown. Mm -hmm. Les Brown, Jim Ron, um, Eric Thomas. Yep. Right. And and uh, there was this wonderful thing that Jim Ron said, and I'm not sure if this was Jim Ron or whatever, but like they said that the nose you get at the door, they are your practice pitches. Mm -hmm. Like you're practicing that. Yeah. You're you're practicing your pitch for the yes. Yeah. So uh, that really got me through the fact that okay, if they can do it. I can do that too. So now when people say, oh, Raja, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that and this and that. I'm, I'm like, hey, listen, if I can do it, so can you. Mm -hmm. No one's stopping you. You got the same opportunity, even better opportunities. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, it's very important to understand that if someone else can do things that you want to do, you can actually do that. Of course. You got, yeah. just got to spend time. So, like, it was essentially the, the proof of concept. Proof of concept. It, it's actually very interesting because... What I try to do as someone who does the podcast, like, you know, interviews different people, is I try and connect similar attributes and proof of concept so far has been very, very common in terms of whether it's trading related or just generally success. Mm. And it's very interesting you say that. So you seeing other people, you know, who you know, who are even younger than you, but seeing other people achieve this result, regardless of whether you've done it or whether your result is there yet. Was it similar in trading as well then? Sort of observing Uncle Ted and knowing this guy's, hey, in the same similar area to me, and yet he's, you know, on this next level now. So like way less time and making more money than I'm doing in the sales side of things. Because to think about it, to do two months of uh, no sales, no income, uh, and push through, because as we say, high turnover rate. When we talk high turnover rate, we talk about people doing, especially door to door, they'll probably last a week and decide, hey, how are you doing this? Two, three days. <laughs> probably, yeah, exactly. You're being generous, man. Two, three days, <laughs> they're like, we call them, hey, you come in? No, <laughs> I'm gonna look for another opportunity. <laughs> Definitely. Like, no, but that's okay. the thing. It's, it's very true. And I can understand yeah. it because, you know, I'm talking, you know, I've done uh, call centers, you know, telesales. Oh, yeah. So like, you know, even a, a week, two weeks, a month, you know, it's quite much more easier because you just sat there and you just pick up a phone. It's much more easier to yeah. sort of face that day to day. Door to door, there might even be one day, you know, because yeah. it is such a, you know, on the spot, putting yourself in the deep end, you know, and it, it's sharpening those skills. You either cut for, you know, you either push yourself or you don't, and that's one of those extreme situations uh, that many people don't ever face. You know, whether that's it's true. the the knock door to door or you know, like the standing on the street doing the charity, you know, collecting the charity. Oh money. yeah, that's another one. Very yeah, similar. I feel bad for them, man. That's really tough. That is a tough one, definitely. But they're the, as I say, they're the things that sharpen the tools. Yeah. So, but the fact is, you started there. You know, two months no income. You know, got that first sale, and as you said, you sort of that first sale for you seems to be like now I've got this. You know now. I've done it now. I've, yeah. I've unlocked the door because it seems that you scaled up quite quick uh, from there. But you also mentioned that you became a manager. So do you have a mindset? You've already talked about the competitive competitive edge. Do you have the mindset of when you do something, you want to be the best at it? You know, you want to be able to excel at it and be successful at it. So it sounds like in the sales side of things, you did that. Yeah. Um, my whole thing was that if I'm doing something, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to see how everyone else is doing the same thing. Yeah. And then my whole mentality is that, okay, how can I do it better? Mm -hmm. You know, how can I make it better? How can I make it easier for people? Or 
like you know something of that nature and that's something we've done with my businesses too and um something you talk about um uh like you know how did we kind of like took sales the same uh mindset into trading yeah the way how that worked is like i basically saw uncle ted yeah because to me uncle ted was somebody who's making like two three thousand dollars a day and i'm like wow i'm making like maybe 500 a day you know so 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 i saw how he was operating. So when we first started, when we went into a group, so we used to have these private Zoom calls, right? Yeah. And every morning around like maybe like 5.30, 6 a.m., we'd start a Zoom chat or we'd be on a Facebook group, whatever, that's like typing, okay, you know, we're looking for a USD CAD to go up or down because, you know, at that point I was in Canada mm -hmm. and uh, it was logically made sense to look at CAD. Of course, yeah. You know, and the U.S. was right there. <laughs> yeah. So logically, USD CAD. Yep. You know, we mm -hmm. didn't know any better. Well, USD CAD, you know. Yeah, why not? So, uh, and uh, and gold, mm -hmm. right? So um, what happened was, so we would jump onto the Zoom calls. We would take one trade, two trades, whatever, and then Ted would leave. You know, he'd bounce because he had to go to his job. At that time, he, he still had the job. Mm -hmm. So he'd bounce. And then... Um, We'd still be on the Zoom chats and whatever, like, you know, trading this and that, blah, blah, blah. And then all the profits we made from the first trade, we'd lose it by London close, yeah. like till 10 a.m. You know, we'd lose it. Then Ted eventually left his job and I, I was still working at my business a little bit here and there, losing, winning, losing, winning. And then a point came where the first six, seven months, I lost around like, a, like 102, 103,000. You know, all my savings gone. You know, everything that we've saved for me and my wife, all gone. Well, majority of it gone. And I'm thinking, how is this guy making money day after day, every morning? Mm. You know, so I started to look at it logically, you know, and, and logic dictated that, okay, he's coming on the charts, looking at gold or, you know, uh, USD, yen, whatever, looking at gold, taking one trade and then going about his day, going to the gym. And we're sitting there till London close, <laughs> trying to find more trades, trying mm -hmm. to make more money. You know, so then I looked at myself, okay, you know what? If he can do it, I can do it too. So all I got to do is copy exactly what he's doing. Just one or two trades in the morning and I'm done. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Bro, trust me, in two months, things just changed. In just two months. And this is what I tell guys. Like guys say, oh, you know, I can't win and blah, blah. I'm, I'm like, listen, just focus on one or two trades for two months. Mm -hmm. If things don't change, go back to your old ways and yeah. keep losing. Mm -hmm. Right? I promise you. So, uh, yeah, it just came, came from like, you know, if he can do this, I can do it too. But, yeah. but, but how to do it better? There you go. So in terms of that, it's like the blueprint's there. You know, yeah. people like yourself, people like Uncle Ted, people who have done it successfully and have done it and documented the journey and share these aspects of it. They're leaving the blueprint. Right. But it's up to you to then observe that, you know, even if they're not specifically well, you've specifically said many times two trades a day, you know, one pair, for example, you've said these things over and over. But even if you didn't, the fact is you get to observe these individuals and you well, like you did and you decided to see what is this person doing? You know, this person who's in the position that I want to be in rather than. Ah, uh, you know, if you know, he must be a scammer, he must be, you know, he must be a liar. You know, I'm do, I'm doing, I'm trying, and it's not working. Yeah. And that's why I feel like the mentality happens, and it's always interesting because, you know, when you speak to these people who have this sort of negative energy, this built-up aggression, or whatever it may be, it's normally the case where they haven't got these disciplines, they haven't decided to make these changes. They've just done the same thing over and over, over and over. And what's interesting is, as you mentioned, you lost a lot of money, right, before you got to that point. And, you know, when you lost that money, was it a case where you're kind of just doing the same habits, negative habits, right, which you might not have realized were negative at the time? Was it a case, though, that you were just doing that over and over again, you know, over and over again? Yeah, and all negative habits over and over again, over mm -hmm. trading, over risking, depositing money, then again, trying to make that money back. The biggest thing was that I was trying to make my losses back. Yeah, 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 you know, like once you're down, let's say like twenty thousand, your mindset shifts to that. Okay, instead of getting a winning trade, let's try to make this loss back. Yeah, and once you start chasing your loss, you start accumulating losses. Yeah, and that's something I discovered later on in life. Like you know, you can't chase losses. The more you chase losses, you're gonna lose them. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're gonna compound more losses. So, so I think that's something that I really had to change because I knew that okay. What I got to do is I got to focus on getting a winning trade. Yeah. And it goes back to my sales, right? I got one sale. All I got to focus on is getting the next sale. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about the no's. I don't have to worry about the rejections. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about what people think about me. 
you know, because I think sales, they, it built a really thick skin. Yeah. Because, you know, they abuse you. They call you like uh, racial slurs. Like, you name it. Mm-hmm. All kinds of people. Your sales, what area was that in in Canada? Oh, all over Canada. All over? All over. Wow. You're going from the hillbillies to like posh areas. And yeah. man, it was crazy. Because people don't realize that like, I've been to the... Eastern side of Canada, it's uh, New Brunswick. Oh, right? yeah. So even to this day, <laughs> yeah, right? New Brunswick. Exactly, yeah. So even yeah. to this day, New Brunswick is the, the very much like disconnected to a lot of the world. Like the internet yes. speed in the place I went was two megabytes. Yeah. I was thinking of moving there. I was like, I can't move here. As a trader, I can't, <laughs> I can't even load up MT4. Yeah, exactly. Um, and bless them, like they're amazing people. Amazing. And a lot of the time, like they will have stereotypes without realizing, you know, just because of the uh, lack of awareness, you know, and yeah. the lack of connectivity of the world. And they're not um, even being racist. It's just how that how they are. Yeah. It's yeah. just that their nature. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if you take offense to that, that's on you. But they're yeah. just being honest, polite, yeah. but in a different way. Because <laughs> like, they said, oh, like, when I went there, they, they said, oh, um, you're Muslim. I was like, yeah, I'm Muslim. They said, which church is that? What's <laughs> that? We have 12 different types of churches. Like, yeah. yours, we will have yours here. And I was yeah. like, bless them. You know, <laughs> they just don't know. And I remember FaceTiming someone and they were like, they were shocked. I was like, yeah, this person's in England. They're like, what? This is incredible. Like, honestly, it was like, it was really strange to see because obviously yeah. we're so used to it now. It was strange to see someone like seeing FaceTime for like properly for the first time and stuff. Pe- so. People from New Brunswick, they're probably watching this and saying, this guy thinks we live in the Stone Age. <laughs> 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 the thing is, they won't be watching, man. I'm yeah. telling you. I'm telling you, like, it's just so strange. It was, it was so eye opening for me because like, yeah. it was the first time I'd seen that. And so like to hear you selling to these individuals is interesting too because as you say, that having someone like yourself, <laughs> tall yeah. guy, you know, probably, you know, at this point, probably more confident as well, knocking at someone's door, you know, disrupting the day, as you say. And, yeah. and you know, I can only imagine the sort of different <laughs> reactions you would probably get. Some would probably be very happy. But yeah. I can imagine the amount of, uh, essentially, you could take as negative. But just, again, you don't know their, their days. But as you say, each, you know, you're not really bothered about each outcome. But it took you a lot of losses, a lot of hardship, a lot of lessons to get through that. You know that all those losses that you had, was that the lowest moment in your trading journey, would you say? That period of just huge amounts of losses and, and as you say, pretty much the life savings going? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was. And my wife was like, hey, like, you know, like, you got to make a change, mm. you know. And um, <clears throat> I looked at all my losses and I'm like, and I'm saying to myself that, that, that this train has already left the platform. It's running at full speed with no brakes at this point. Mm. So all you got to do is start shoveling more coal to the train so it keeps on moving. Mm. And I knew, and at that point, I knew that if there are people in this world who can be successful from Forex, from Mm. trading and all these things, why can't I be one of those people? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so this belief was in me. And I told it this too. Hey, like, there's no turning back at this point. Yeah. Like, you know, we've lost this much. What am I going to... And, bro, at that point, at that point uh, in Canada, we had Skip the Dishes. Now, Skip the Dishes is like um, Uber Eats. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And um, I thought about... Actually, I didn't think about it. I signed up to that. Skip the dishes. Mm-hmm. I signed. I, I signed up to that. I remember their whole like this food bag. So what happens was you you register, mm-hmm. and then you gotta pay one hundred forty dollars to get their food bag. Mm-hmm. You know. So I went to this. I I went to one of their depots. I bought the food bag. Yeah. And on my drive back, I'm calculating that okay, maximum what I'm gonna be able to make from this is probably gonna be four hundred a week, maximum. 400 a week i'm thinking about this and as i'm driving i'm like 400 a week 400 a week and i'm like this doesn't make any sense i lost 102 105 thousand dollars and 400 a week and if i can trade with a one lot one day i can make probably a hundred dollars or like 200 dollars, you know in in one day mm-hmm. and i turn around <laughs> went to the <laughs> depot and i'm like yeah i need a refund i don't need this bag anymore and that was the point where i knew that okay you know what i had to change something yeah. And that change came from not worrying about the losses, mm. worrying about whether can I get a winning trade or not. Because because um, in the beginning, like every any new trader that starts, right? Once you get a winning trade, yeah. you get this hype. Mm-hmm. You're like, we got a winning trade. Now we got a winning trade. Now we got to get another winning trade. And then we got to get another winning trade. And then long story short, what happens by the end of the day? You've lost your profits. Yeah. Plus you're in drawdown. You know, so I was like, okay, you know what? If I'm going to w- get a winning trade, I'm going to cherish that winning trade mm. because the market allowed me to get that winning trade. Most people don't understand this. When you get a winning trade, you fought against the market 
You fought against the banks, mm. institutions, and you fought against the traders. So that's a sign where you're like, if you're in a desert, you get water, you're going to cherish that water. You know, so I was, I started cherishing my every winning trade. Mm -hmm. And I started to see that, okay, if I got this winning trade, how can I replicate that the next day? Mm -hmm. Because then I made a, and uh, and uh, there's another thing that guys do is they make this Excel sheet, right? Make their Excel sheet, they put like 2% gain, and then yeah. after 60 days, they're like, oh, if I deposit $1,000, by the end of 60 days, I'm going to have 100000 Yeah, the we're compound. Gonna be, <laughs> yeah. We're going to be rich, mm -hmm. you know? So, so I didn't, I did that, but what I also did was, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give myself four months mm -hmm. of just taking one winning trade, and making sure how can I replicate it the next day and replicate that same trade the next day. Mm -hmm. And I'm only going to focus on the same strategy and that's it, the same candle pattern, the same time, same time of volume. Mm. But if I get a losing trade, then th that's just going to be the probability of the outcome, mm -hmm. right? Because if I do the same thing over and over again, over a bigger span of things, it's going to be a profitable outcome. So you can't attach yourself to that one losing trade. That's it. So like thinking of probabilities. So in terms of, of that, you essentially promote the less is more, right? You, yeah. you less is more. So one pair, you know, number, select number of trades, getting a specific edge, right? So just worked on your specific edge, played it out for X amount of time and actually stayed disciplined towards mm -hmm. it. So was it, was there ever a moment then before that? where you sort of put certain parts of that in place where maybe, okay, I'm going to stick to this one, uh, one pair, maybe stick to this number of trades, but then you just weren't disciplined towards it and therefore ended up maybe doing it for a week. And then, you know, you take a loss and then bang, bang, bang. It just sort of goes off tilt, as people say. Um, no, it didn't really happen that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think now, I don't know if it would have happened if I wasn't married. Or if I didn't have any kids mm. at the it, time, it, did you? Did you, you? I know you were married. Oh yeah, did you I have was kids married. at the time as well. Yeah. Uh, so my son was born in 2017, October mm. 2017. It's around similar time. Yeah, yeah. So October 2017 was a time when I was recovering. Well, not recovering losses, but I was getting like massively consistent mm -hmm. during that time. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I cannot break my plan. I too much you, riding on you it, just yeah. can't break your plan mm -hmm. you know like there were times where like you know um i'm in a lot of trading groups and mm -hmm. sometimes you know you get these analysis these this um, amazing oh bro this move <laughs> <laughs> this is the one <laughs> this is the one yeah this is the one so i just shielded myself from all of that mm -hmm. you know and it takes a lot of mental effort to do that mm -hmm. you know because um back in the day in the 1990s it's to trade you had to plot out prices, mm -hmm. you know, two days beforehand. If you're going to take it, let's say if you're going to take a trade, yeah. you have uh, prices plotted out two days before. You know, now, bro, you pick up your phone, it takes you less than a second to take a trade. So true, yeah. Yeah, so you got to just be like, no, you know what? I took one trade, I can't break my plan. That's it. Well, it sounds like you did something similar because what I did was in my journey as I was very similar, losing a lot of money, losing a lot of money, uh, just chasing, chasing the losses. Welcome right? to the club. There you go. I, mean, <laughs> I honestly believe everyone goes for it, right? Yes. They have to go for it. Yeah. But I think as well, there's almost an element where people could go through a very similar thing that you mentioned is like you have an ultimate ultimatum moment, right? Which is normally at that lowest moment where you decide either I got a change or that's it. Trading's done. As yeah. you, I think you mentioned on the Alex G podcast, it was very similar. Um, because at the end of the day, similar for me is like, I got to a point where I, I um, the rent money, I trade, I said, I'll load this in the account and you know, no. I'll be able to flip this, you know, and I'm married <laughs> at the time. And um, I think my daughter was less than a year old and it was a very humbling moment where you I had traded to tell the my rent wife. Money. Yeah, I had to tell my, I told my wife, I said, you know, babe, you know, the, the rent money's gone, <laughs> you know, the rent money's gone. And you know, that's hilarious. And the bless her, she was, she wasn't happy about it, of course. Yeah, yeah, of and course. we had obviously a, a discussion, but at the end of the day, she still didn't say you need to quit trading. Mm. She did say, however, very similar to as you've said, is that you have to change. You know, you have to decide, like, are you going to change or are you not? And then it's like that ultimatum moment, which made that deciding factor. So from there, very similar, put an actual plan in place, stick to that plan for X yeah. number amount of time. And I find it very, very interesting because I think it's, almost necessary like you have to have that realization like in your i think you mentioned actually um on the alex g podcast when you first started the first month or two you made some profit and then from there it kind of just went for you know six seven whatever whatever amount of time where it was losses yeah and i've always said you know like in the alchemist the book talks about beginner's luck mm. and i think that everyone in every endeavor you will when you first do it you'll get beginner's luck 
so that life is kind of like te- whatever is God life is testing you to say this is what's possible yeah and now let's see if you will, you know if you will do what it takes you know if you're worthy of having this yes you know and uh, I think when you get you know to that ultimate moment and realizing the lessons of the market lessons of being successful as a whole and in terms of trading I think in terms of like entrepreneurship and trading entrepreneurship you could still not have your mindset in check and still be quite successful while in trading you have to have your mindset in check to be successful i don't think there's like one or the other like you can be kind of semi-okay it has to be like you've mastered yourself you've mastered that discipline um and not everyone's going to do it but i think those who decide you know they've gone through the hardship enough to realize that i cannot do this anymore um so how was it for you you know being married uh, kids on the way or kids here coming um how was it for you in that moment you know in that in the in those lows you know how was it was there literally a moment where you thought that's it can't do it no more or was it more i have to you know, there's no other option no it was all about i have to mm. plus also like you know uh, i i i knew people who were doing well they were, they were making money from the markets and i knew i could do it there were times where where i would just like you know um crawl up on the sofa and just cry Mm. because it just wasn't working very painful. you know very painful bro like like i take a trade draw down i let the trade open draw down then i would go pray and after praying praying to god it didn't help because mm. like the market and god are two different things yeah you know <laughs> and what happened was draw down would get even bigger you mm. know <laughs> what's going on over here <laughs> yeah, what's happening yeah, yeah yeah so so i think it was very important to like to really know that okay gotta be very patient Mm-hmm. got to be you know got to calm down that's the main thing you got to calm down because because a lot of times now what happens is that like you know kids kids i'm going to call like you know early 20s mid 20s like you know kids they're more prone to uh i mean their whole mindset is to have success now yeah you know and um to be honest like in our group market fluidity a lot of the successful people are the ones who have jobs. Mm-hmm. They're doing well in trading. Yeah, yeah, they have careers. They have businesses. Like all the boot camps we do, most of my boot camps are people from like business backgrounds. Yeah. We had a uh, we had an individual who sold his medical company. He took an exit in millions, and he now came to trading. He's like, hey, I just want to learn how to trade so I can scale up. Mm. Now you know, so those people are much more much more successful because they have a cushion. Yeah. Right? They're not relying on trading is going to make me wealthy. Yeah. Trading is going to pay my debt. If mm-hmm. you're in debt, trading is not going to help you with that. Oh, 100%. It's going to increase that debt. Mm-hmm. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Because like, the financial foundation is so important. And I always say yeah. to people, you know, like, like we said, the youngsters in particular, but even generally, even the people who are working jobs, they're very quick to assume, I, okay, if I quit my job and go all in on trading, I've got you know 10,000 savings. That can last me six months. If I go all in for six months, I, I surely I can master this. Yeah. You know, and... and I would like to think there's enough people talking about it and enough people warning saying that this is you know not a six months quick fix you know this is something that will take time and it's you know the time isn't there is no time stamp like is you have to put three years in have to put five years in or you have to spend this much mm. it always always all dependent on the person but you know to go all in in that way especially if you have family especially if you have commit uh, you know responsibilities it's a very dangerous game and as you say debt wise I always say to people as well like if you don't if you're in debt. The reality of you getting in, you know, you're trading on track and being full time is extremely slim. Is it impossible? No, anything's possible. No. Yeah. But the reality is, you know, extremely difficult. You're going to put yourself in the one of the hardest situations in in the world. Absolutely. When in reality, yes, it may take a bit longer. Yes, it may be a bit harder to to work and save. But the reality is, you're going to give yourself the best possible chance. And in that moment is where you can be learning, yeah. right? And building your skill set, building that discipline, so that when you are in the right position. You can then obviously do it in a much more sustainable and calmer fashion. Mm. So like with yourself, obviously going through that those low moments. One thing I did want to talk about is obviously in the sales job, you were making good money. So how was it for you obviously making good money and then obviously trying trading at the same time? Because a lot of people would say that's a good thing. But and, and obviously there will be negatives of it too, because obviously if you're making a lot of money and you have this thing like trading, it's so easy to throw that money into trading instead. Yeah. So how was it for you obviously having this income and then obviously learning the skill of trading at the same time? Um, I just wanted to scale. Mm. That's all what I wanted to do. I wanted to scale. And you know, it goes back to the same thing, that there's someone who's doing well than me and more than me. Mm-hmm. I got to be that guy. Mm. And, and like, you know, if I can't be that guy, maybe I can get close to that or become even better. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so that's all what it was. Like, you know, I was making good money from business, but there's always more. 
Yeah. You know, I was having a discussion with my friends yesterday, um, mm. and we were we were only talking about there's 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 no limit to the things you can have. Mm. You can reach a level, and once you reach that level. And then you get into the network of people yeah. who have more. You're like, oh shit! Now the level, now now the bar has been raised. Mm-hmm. So now you can go up to the next level. But the people in the lower level, they're saying, oh look at that guy. He wants more. He wants more. But they don't understand that when you want more, only because you're in the environment where people have much more, mm. and you're not envying them in a negative way. You're looking at them saying that okay. How can I be that guy? How can I be on that level? Yeah. So, so it's just like you know this thirst of success. There's no end to it. Mm-hmm. Whether it's like you know, in in like you know multiple situations, business relationships, you know whatever. There's no end to how far you want to go. Of course, yeah. There's always like more to strive towards. I don't yes. think in life I think the, we're guilty. I was definitely very guilty of it, thinking that when I achieve, especially in trading, for example, like when I achieve big withdrawals. My life's gonna change. You know, that's it. I can relax then. And then when the big withdrawals came, I was like, nothing changed. I still had to wash the dishes. You know, there's yeah. still, there were still dishes. I, <laughs> my wife was still gonna, uh, you know, argue with me. Yeah. You know, my my kids are still gonna want something from me. You know, um, you know, things don't stop just because suddenly you've gotten to this certain perspective. And mm. I think it's very interesting you say that because, as you say, like all you're doing as you level up. Uh, through, what I like to say is every zero is like a new level, right? It has mm. positives, but also has negatives. You know, like taxes and whatever it may yeah, be. It's true. So like. As you're saying, like you, you're leveling up, and you're getting your awareness is growing because now, even though you're leveling up, now you're meeting people or in environments where they're you know, ten levels above, and suddenly now what you have, not that it seems little, but you realize there is more, it right? Is. And there is more to strive towards. And I think in life that's a positive thing to realize is that it doesn't end, right? It should be something that is motivating. And I always say that it's the journey itself that's the reward. You know, the reward yeah. itself is in the journey. The, yes, there's challenges and there are hard times. And if anything, they're the moments that build you. As you, you know, as we've explained, you had that moment where you, you know, savings are all gone. And if you didn't have that moment, who knows if you would then, you know, would do the changes necessary to, to push on and, and get to where you are now. We're never going to know. We're never going to know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Because you took the action. You yes. did it. But, you know, um, you mentioned God earlier, for example. right? And I know in our culture, um, I get a lot of messages. I don't know if you do. I would imagine you do, but I get a lot of messages from people saying that you know trading isn't allowed in in our religion, and and I always say to people because they try and talk about interest, mm. right? And that's the reason why, or leverage. That's the reason why. And I always explain to people like, yes, you are right. It's not allowed if you have no plan. If you do it just like you just go in and try and throw on a buy and sell, you are gambling. So that's not allowed. Yeah. But if you've done it correctly in terms of you know to get in the education, no matter what it is, education. You educate yourself, you have a plan, and you decide to be disciplined towards it. I see no problem, right? Because in, at the end of the day, if you go to, you know, you go on holiday, you're exchanging money. That's FX, right? On a much smaller scale, of course. That's true. But that's FX. It's the exact same principle. You're just, uh, and let's say you've exchanged money on one day, and then uh, two months later, the exchange rates change, and you exchange. So also, you're paying spread. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And worse spread. <laughs> way worse. worse. Way worse. Spread. Way worse spread. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, if that's fine, and, and what I feel like happens is, is that Obviously, they're going to these imams, for example, these teachers for advice. And these teachers, again, it's kind of similar to um, the parent situation. They just have a lack of awareness, yes. a lack of understanding of what the industry is. So it's out of love still because they don't want you to do harm. So when they hear about it, when you, when you explain trading in a very basic way, it would be like, I can put in a thousand pounds and I can make 10,000. That just sounds like gambling, right? That's true. So to them, they're assuming, oh, that's, that's, that sounds a bit dangerous. That sounds a bit like gambling. Yeah. So probably stay away. Uh, but the imam, bro, mm. the imam does not know what forex trading is. Of course, they don't know what lot sizes are. The imam does not know what swap fees are, what mm-hmm. leverage is, what what like you know rollovers are. Mm-hmm. They don't know that. They only know what they think they know, and they only they will they, they, they will only tell you the things that will keep you coming back to them mm. for more information. Unfortunately, that's how the imams are now these days. Well, yeah. Well, I think it's always been that way. It's know? always been that that's way. That's the yeah. not the business, but that's essentially how it works. You know? Yeah, exactly. But how did you, in terms of um, moving back to Pakistan, right? What was what was that decision like, bro? Like, it must be for your dad. It must have been strange. Is he still? Is he in Pakistan? Or is he still? No, they moved. Of- uh, they later on they moved with us. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, cool. yeah. How was yeah. that for him though? Because he was like, I took you there, and now <laughs> now we're going back. How what was that like? Well, for you? well, what happened was it, it it was all for the kids. Like you know, when you got kids, you're gonna move mountains for them. Of course. You know, and um, this is when. Uh, uh, 
COVID came and Canada got locked down and then my kids went, yeah. my, my, my kids went to Pakistan and they were like, you know, in the village over there with like hens and goats and and like just freedom. Mm. You know, then they came back and they had to quarantine for two weeks and and I just looked at that and then I looked at where my life was. I'm like, okay, I got a new car because that's when I, uh, I bought a new car. I'm paying payments on it. I'm paying insurance on it, but I can't drive it for two weeks because mm. I might get the flu or someone else might get the flu. So I'm like, okay. And I'm not restricted to this place to make money mm. because I'm making money online. Mm -hmm. So realistically, I'm only tied to this place because I think that I have this house. So I'm tied to this house. Mm. I'm like, I can just disconnect and maybe move wherever I want to go. You know, so I discussed this with my wife. Well, I didn't discuss it with her. I mean, amazing person absolutely brilliant it supported me and everything i told her uh, in april i told her end of april i told her hey we should move to pakistan she's like oh okay we're gonna think about it like she's the kind of person who's gonna think about things and rationalize Blah. things and relax i'm the kind of person yeah i gotta do this now <laughs> you know? similar, yeah. so end of april i told her we're gonna move to pakistan she's like when i'm like Next month, <laughs> she's like, "What?" <laughs> you know. So, so then we, uh, then we sold our furniture. We put the house on rent, and uh, yeah, and then we moved to Pakistan. And I think the biggest reason also was that so that my kids can come over here and they can understand the culture. Mm. You know, because I think the West has lost the sense of culture. There's no culture there. Damn. Like even now, even now, if you are in a setting where you have people sitting, you know, in a room, mm. and if a new person walks in. Everyone's going to stand up. Everyone's going to stand up, shake his hand, greet him. And that's the kind of culture I want them to live in. Mm. You know, whether when it comes to the West, if a new person comes in, no one's going to stand up out of respect. Nobody is say, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? You know, so, so that really Very, bothered even me. Not even that nowadays. Now it's just... <laughs> not even... That. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so it was really important for me to move my kids there to really... So they can understand where I came from, what our social values are, what mm. our belief systems are. You know, so um, I think I think so far it's turning out to be great. Uh, my parents, I thought that they will have some sort of uh, they'll show some resistance, but um, they they told my brother, "Hey, he actually did a very good job <laughs> <laughs> moving to Pakistan." Yeah, <laughs> you know, so they moved with us, and uh, now business wise, we're trying to move to Dubai. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense, and obviously, you know, the beauty is, is that Dubai, such an amazing place, is very close to Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. So traveling wise, not too bad. I know you've done too much of it these recent weeks, oh, like man. back and forth, back and forth. I hate flying now. I, I bet I don't blame you whatsoever. <laughs> but you know, it's an incredible thing because a lot of people making a move like that, especially you know, what some would consider backwards, mm. right? But as you've explained, you know, culture wise, and especially the state of the West at the moment, uh, especially due to you know the the lockdowns we had. And how certain countries did certain things. And, and I think was, you know, Canada was surprised at. Because they only recently allowed people who weren't vaccinated to travel again. Yes. Right. And yet, you know, I like one of my very close friends. I was actually at his house in December. Um, you know, it was so sad to you know see his mum, you know, be so upset because she could not travel to see her own daughter simply because of this rules. And that's two years on, you know, oh, when wow. all these other countries had completely yeah. scrapped it, you know. And it was just shocking to me because I I actually thought about moving to Canada. The whole reason I went to New Brunswick no. was I was getting married <laughs> to buy a farm in New yeah. Brunswick. Oh, in my head, wow. I, I had this realization that I need to be in nature. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and therefore, this farm in Canada in New Brunswick was the way. And I went there on my honeymoon. Imagine yeah. part of my honeymoon. I was like, okay, you're, we're getting married. We need You need to help me decide if we want to live on this farm. So, uh, you know, and I always thought Canada was you know, very progressive, you know, very open, very nice people as well, very uh, accepting as well. Um and then when that lockdown stuff happened, I was so shocked at Canada because I was like, this just didn't seem like the Canadian way, if you will. See, the thing is, if 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 you're not tied to the way you're making money from a from a specific region, mm -hmm. then automatically you have options. Yeah. You know, then, you know, because I have friends over there, they're they're like, hey, man, whatever you did, it's amazing. But right now we can't do that because of they're course. tied to that region. Right. Mm -hmm. So once you make money online and and since COVID started, I told everyone. Start something online, mm -hmm. anything online. Even now, you need to start anything online. It's going to flourish in six, seven months. And then automatically, like it's natural, right? Naturally, you're going to start to think that, okay, can I relocate? Can I move somewhere else? Can I do things differently a little mm -hmm. bit? Because now the money is coming from thin air, basically, right? On, yeah. on, on, 
online. So um, yeah, so that basically motivated me a lot to move to. Definitely. No, no, I don't blame you because at the end of the day, it's like uh, you have the option. You know, you've worked hard at something to be able yeah. to have that freedom. And as everyone always talks about in terms of trading is not only money, but the freedom. Right. And uh, I think a lot of people don't actually end up exercising that freedom because like even in the learning uh, process right, and building that consistency process, a large part of it, as you said, is that you were sitting on the chart for the whole session, for example. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's like the counter the idea of trading. You're not free if you sat there on a chart mm. for probably more hours than you would at the job yeah, and actually true. paying to do it in the end because you're taking all these losses. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of that, once you did get that consistency, you, I know I remember from the Alex G podcast, you said it actually started as a joke, you know, streaming wise. Yeah. And I remember that's where I first heard of you. I first heard of you uh, because you were streaming. Yeah. Was it every day or was it every a particular day? No, that was every day. Every day, right? Every so, day. yeah, I, I first heard of you because you were pretty much the only first trader I had heard of who was live streaming and, and doing it in front of other people. What was that? What was, well, first, what was the decision to say teach or share with others? Where did that come from? Um, it came from the fact that um, they were. So here's what happened. When I first started, came into trading, mm -hmm. right? Of course, like I, like you know, got with Ted and all that, yeah. Because he answered all, uh, he answered a lot of my questions, mm -hmm. you know. And then um, I, and there were also some other big names in the in industry at that point. There were Astro and all this that, and I messaged them as well, like you know, hey, can you uh, tell me something about trading? Any tips in that? And every answer I got was like, here's the link, buy this course, mm -hmm. and you're gonna know everything you want to know. You know, this came from guys in London, came from guys in Miami. There was a group in Australia. They all said the same thing. Yeah. And I'm like, why? You know, and I and I said to myself that, okay, if I get better, I'm going to be the kind of an avenue for people where they can come up to and get some free knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Like some some free game to make money in trading. Yeah. And that's where live streams also started. Now, now the live stream, the basic started as a joke that, okay, you know what? <laughs> We're going to have someone with a camera yeah. and a mask on, and he's just going to trade saying nothing just gonna trade he's gonna win a trade and say made money today and then stream closed yeah you know so so that's how it started so once it began i think it grew a lot mm -hmm. because as i said i was the only one i was pretty unique yeah live stream only one and man they were like so much value so much knowledge and that's what i wanted i just wanted to give value mm -hmm. and as business people like i know some people sell courses and this and that they show off like flashy things cars watches money to sell a course and whatever that's totally fine right but but what they were missing was and this is what i saw too what they were missing was they weren't giving enough to get something back yeah, yeah. you know and uh, uh there's a guy called alex hermosi yeah, yeah, yeah. On on YouTube. Mm -hmm. This is what he talked about uh, three, four days ago, too. He's like, if you want to get something back in massive returns, yeah. you have to give in massive returns. Yeah. Because the more you give, the more you give, the more someone's going to say that, okay, like, you know what? He is an authoritative figure in this subject. And yeah. look at all the knowledge he's been given, all this information he's been providing. Maybe he has more to offer. Yeah. You know? And then the population gravitates towards that automatically. Yeah. It's what I like to call fair exchange. Right? Fair exchange, yeah. Like, there is an element, especially if you're the person who's putting the information out, where you will give more, right? And you will give more. And uh, in essence, it will balance out eventually. But I completely agree with you in terms of like, if you're someone out there who's struggling to find a community or an educator, uh, especially nowadays, because back then there was very limited choices. Yeah. As you said, Australia, uh, I know of, yeah. Because it was a very similar time when I started, actually, oh. which shocked me because I was like, oh. Yeah, it's, it's motivated me now to be like, okay, <laughs> if he's, we start a similar time, he's here and I'm still about here. It's a motivating factor, right? But um, but yeah, I know back then there was not as many on socials. There were some, but not as many. And uh, so yeah, there was a few groups in certain countries, right? Not as many now. But nowadays the issue is that there's positives, right? Of mm. having so many, right? Uh, but there's also a lot of negatives because then you, yeah. who do you choose? And I think uh, a brilliant thing that you said is that if you can DM someone and they will happily answer. Yeah, don't get me wrong. If they're not going to give you their whole strategy and your know, routine every single day, but... If they can answer the questions of like where to learn, for example, where to get basics or basic yeah. answers, it means that it's a huge difference, right? As you say, instead of just, here's the link to my website, go join. I think it's a very important factor. If people are struggling to choose, use, you know, use this awareness, use this time, because no one's rushing you. And if they are rushing you, that's a red flag, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's a definitely a very important point you brought up there is that, you know, take people in the value that they give. How much free value are they giving? 
and how genuine are they are in terms of their responses and how they act because um you know it's so easy to as you say like it's fine to have the flashy things it's fine to use those things to promote a course but are you giving some value even if it's in the smallest sense are you giving some value because if you're not then it's not fair to you know expect people to give you anything right to give you anything because if you're not giving any sort of value for that then it's uh i don't think well i think nowadays it's getting better right because i think people are starting to think back then because there were sort of very few options there's very few options to then choose between well now because there are more options it's uh it's become a lot easier for people to sort of pick and choose yeah i think people still have the unfortunate case of jumping which we'll get to no doubt But, but in terms of the streams then so they picked up from there right and uh it started with just as a joke, as you say, and I think it's yeah. interesting because uh, I feel I always feel like when you don't plan something, usually something good ends up coming out of it. But when you force something and try and be so like you know, um, you know, like sort of stringent and I, I'm going to plan this, this, and this, and yeah. the live stream needs to be 60 minutes, and this, you know, once you do that that sort of scale, it never works out. It's always stressful, and but when you actually do something that's not planned, it ends up turning into something that's really. Uh, you know, sort of beautiful and, and long lasting. So, yeah. you know, from there, did you ever see yourself getting to where you are now? Or was it literally just kind of day by day, week by week, and things just grew naturally? My whole idea was to be the biggest Forex live streamer in on YouTube. Yeah. And and like, you know, I achieved that. What what people also call that this, uh, this uh, uh, like, you know, uh, Raja Banks, the host of the New York Session live streams, this basically became like, okay, like, you know, this is the prime time of YouTube Forex education. It was the prime time. Like, you know, the biggest audience ever on NFP, I think the maximum we had was around 10,000 people watching live. That's a lot, man. 10,000 people watching you, Mm. listening to every word you say, right? So then you start to think about that. Okay, there are 10,000 people listening to everything I say, and they're all traders. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, you know, some organic. No, random people, yeah. They're all specific traders. What can we do to monetize that? Mm -hmm. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, what can we do to monetize that? Maybe like a service or some announcement or or something like, like that. So I think building an audience was the best thing we ever did. Mm -hmm. Hands down. And you did it from free value. You did, it. you did free value it attracted people because of the value yeah. and then at the end of the day not only that because of all these people then who are coming to you they want more time yes. right they want more specific time they want specific teachings they want education so they're asking you for it as well and you know at the end of the day as a trader and as an entrepreneur why is it that we always say the words you know seven income streams and multiple income streams is the way but as soon as a trader does it right as soon as a trader does it and even if they do it in the best way possible and in a, with a genuine intention, suddenly a lot of people try to castrate these people by saying, oh, you know, you're selling a course, you're making money from a course. But it's like, but at the end of the day, aren't you also shouting that, hey, seven income streams is the way to being you know, financially free? Yeah. Um, I find it very bizarre, you know, and I'm sure you get it quite often. How do you handle these you know, conflicting opinions of others or, you know, in the beginning, more likely? I, I can imagine at this scale now you kind of don't really care but at that time was there ever a time where these opinions of others was kind of kind of getting to you a bit or no not at all man yeah like like i came from a ruthless sales background yeah. you know what people said about me i thought about me doesn't really matter mm. unless they're taking food from a table then it's hands-on war of course but yeah. other than that it it basically di- didn't matter and to be honest man like you know you don't really need seven streams of income to make a million of course, you yeah. can make a million from just one product mm. you know, magic keys now it's worth around seven million wow. right we've done almost like 2.5 million in sales in just two years incredible you know so that just one rainbow colored keyboard <laughs> which people make fun of that's a million dollar product mm-hmm. right so 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 i tell guys like if you're going to do something make sure that you're the best at it yeah and that only comes from discipline Mm -hmm. and um um, like you know when we started off our magic keys the main selling point was just from the audience yeah youtube because i saw what every other influencer was doing they were only big on instagram yeah you know if you got a five hundred thousand followers on instagram Mm -hmm. that means five hundred thousand people know you only on instagram yeah if instagram gets shut down you're done yeah you have no audience on twitter you have no audience on youtube you got nothing (laughs) you know so so that was also one of the calls too that okay um i have instagram 
I got to start building my YouTube too. Yeah. Because if Instagram gets shut down, I'm done. So I got to build an audience on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I got to build an audience on Twitter now. I got like almost 40,000 followers on Twitter. You done it quick, man. I seen you. You it jumped on Twitter. Quick. You you went on Twitter and went attack mode, man. Yeah. You not only in like in every in every way as well, like so the tweets, the polarizing. You know what you're doing, man. Honestly, like in yeah. terms of, I respect it a lot because you know. And then I I jumped on Twitter probably similar time to when you did. Oh yeah. And again, the it's like a 10x or 100x, right? Because you know what you're doing and you do it in a way which is. Uh, necessary in right. any industry you're in you have to ruffle fre- uh, some feathers yeah. if you're not ruffling feathers man you have to do it yeah. because that that creates attention it's something I learned right and I learned oh, it very okay. interesting because I've done I do podcasts right we do podcasts very wholesome conversation I've yeah. done you know YouTube videos I've done uh, you know case studies you, know, you name it right it's probably similar to yourself and the funny thing is the thing that got the most growth ever was this 20 second clip I did like a <laughs> reel where I literally all I said was the um, the forex lifestyle is easy, right? This is what I said. The forex lifestyle is easy. So once you have the skill set, I can trade two to three hours a day, and I can make the average sal- yearly salary in two to three hours, right? Oh, I think I, I yeah. one point eight million views that got, right? Wow! Because of exactly what you said that because it ruffled yeah. feathers, it got it pissed people off because it's like it's not easy, it's not easy, it's not easy. But they didn't listen to what I said. I said once you have the skill set, yeah. that skill set bit is the most important bit, right? It's it's. <laughs> Obviously, if I could, I would say... 0.8 million views on that reel. And it's still going. (laughs) Bro, it's still going. And it's insane to me because it it really opened my eyes to like, I can sit there and do a podcast for two hours. I could do a video for 20 minutes talking about all the things you need to do and really explaining like it's not going to be easy and it's, you know, you're going to have to lose and you're going to have to do all the right things, right? As I have done as well in the Mm. past. But the views wise and engagement wise, it's never going to do anywhere near as the fact of me saying it's easy. And then bang, everyone's opinions are out. And I get it. I honestly get it. But it taught me a valuable lesson of, you know, at the end of the day, in terms of building an audience, in terms of trying to build traction, you have to piss people off. You have to make people question things. It's part of the game. Yeah. And if anything, I think it's very healthy. It's healthy. I think it's healthy for awareness for yourself, like to realize, oh, this is actually good. It makes a debate. And I think you've done that very, very well, yeah. many times over. <laughs> uh, and I think you will continue to do so. You know, yeah. and I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing because... At the end of the day, what I was going to say is I know you get a lot of, not a lot, but you do get some people who are haters, right? And I think everyone does. I think it's yeah. unavoidable. I think if you are planning to be on social media and you're trying to build an audience or even giving value, even if you're not trying to build an audience, you're just trying to build, uh, build value, you will get people who will just come and hate. Right? Yeah, this, this is wrong. Yeah, exactly. This is wrong. <laughs> yeah. or, and the funny thing is, right, what I've noticed about you is that you've traded life right uh on youtube so you've done it live you sat there and watched the market traded for the nfp the danger of the yeah. you know avoid this never trade this right you've traded that live on youtube in front of thousands you've uh you know you've done the my fx book right you've done the um my fx book and you've called trades live as well to do it and even then you'll still get hated saying oh but this or oh, but that yeah you know and as i already know i know the answer already from you it doesn't bother you right but one thing i've kind of learned and i'm guessing you probably will have a similar sort of opinion is that you can never make people happy no you know, you just, and in essence no point trying right yeah is that the same for yourself is yeah it? i mean you can't make everyone happy and i think this also comes from um let's say you're in a family setting mm-hmm. right someone in the family is not going to like you someone in the family is going to say oh he's doing this he's doing this wrong 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 and as your social circle increases mm-hmm. those number of people also increases as well you know, your social circle increases, you go to university, you have a larger group of friends, you know, some group doesn't like you, and then you grow in a business setting, and let's say, unfortunately, you become a social media influencer, mm-hmm. then there are more people who don't like you, but then there are 10 times people than that who do like you. So I think when people do come into this arena, uh, they're more attached to the hate more, mm-hmm. they respond to the hate more, they don't respond to the love as much as they should. This is true. You yeah. know, like like when someone says negative something about you, you're like, oh, I got to respond to this guy. But what about the guys who are loving you? Mm. What about the guys who are complimenting you on the on your knowledge, on the things you've done? What about those people? Mm. You know, so if we all focus on the love we get, I think we're all going to be in a much better place. Because a lot of times people spend time fighting their demons. You know, yeah. they, they fight the negative, they fight the haters, they fight the bad thoughts they have. We don't really focus on the good things we have in life. Mm. You know, so that's where things have really changed for me. Like once we started Magic Keys, we started... Uh, I mean, in markets, market fluidity, now they're all multi-million dollar businesses in themselves, you know. And I've always focused on the positives. Yeah. You know, hate, whatever, I 
troll them from time to time. But um, most of all, I focus on the people who show love, who show appreciation. So then, like, you know, then that motivates me to give more. Mm. You know, once you're focusing on hate more, once you're focusing on addressing the negatives, then you feel like you shouldn't be giving enough. Yeah. You know, so, so once you give attention to the love you're getting, then you give out openly. Yeah. You know, and that's what our religion teaches too. Like, the more you give, the more you're going to get back in return. Karma. Yeah. Right? So just... Get, be, be greedy for karma. Mm-hmm. Be greedy for like good things, good deeds, and man, the universe will bless you tenfold. Definitely, definitely. I couldn't agree more. And you know, for me, what it was, because you know, I had little moments where, you know, you get a little comment here, especially like my time at Astro. You can imagine, even though I'd made the right choice to leave, right? The right choice. I know it makes you laugh. Because I know when I, I probably reached out to you, you're probably thinking, yeah. Oh no, this guy. <laughs> this guy What's he want? <laughs> Who does he want? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. The funny thing is, I, I, you will love this. You will love this completely. I came, I heard your name before, yeah. right? I heard your name, but in terms of seeing your stream, I'd never seen it until there's a guy who worked there with me and he would watch your stream on the floor, the, the trading floor, <laughs> right? And I was like, bro, you're crazy, you know? Like, especially this, this was, this was whilst all this stuff was happening, yeah, the yeah, drama yeah. was happening with you guys. And he had the stream up and I was like, bro, you're, you're asking for it, you are. I was like, yeah, respect it, but like, bro. Uh, and I just found it hilarious. because. So I was let like, me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you. This is totally irrelevant to the podcast, right? Mm-hmm. So, so let me ask you this. Was... Was our name like Rick's Don't Lie or like these live streams ever mentioned on the floor over there? Well, like I said, that guy was, had it up. Oh. Uh, do you mean like in terms of students or in terms of um, like them? Yeah, like someone would say that, oh, you know, but Rick's Don't Lie does this or, or, or this new strategy from YouTube or... To be fair to you, you know, there was... I'll be honest with you, right? It was very strict on purpose, right? Oh. You cannot, you know, not as in terms of us. Even then there was... But like people who would go there in terms of trading floor wise, they would already, you know, it was kind of what had happened was people, they'd created this narrative, right? So like meeting you, for example, I can already get a sense from your socials that you are very easy to talk to, that you treat yourself as a normal, you see yourself as a normal person. You know, you're a successful person, but you know that you would, like you come in today, right? You've spoken to Michael, right? You like, I, I feel guilty. I feel bad because you came in and said, hey, what's your name? You know, and you, you're speaking to Michael, you're speaking to people because you're just an everyday person. You know that, right? Well, these guys, unfortunately, and they're not the only ones. I know there's probably a lot of them out there as well. But these guys created this narrative that they are better. Right? Oh, okay. They are, they are like gods, you know, that yeah. you, should, you should be grateful that you're, forget the, the payment wise, but like you're grateful that you're in this room. <laughs> you're grateful, you know? Yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. honestly, and they would you know, try and influence us mm. as the workers to be like, you need to demand respect. They were trying influencers, buy the watch, get the car. People will respect you more. And I used to think that, bro, but people respect me already for my words. And I would rather they respect me for my words. So, yeah, in terms of like people mentioning it, they weren't really allowed to. They were oh. Not that they, there wasn't like a specific don't yeah, say yeah. this. But it was like people would already know because they're, you know, they're there for them. They're, you know, only this. That's it. Um, but in terms of that guy, he was hilarious, man. This guy, he would literally have the live stream up and I'd say to him, like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're asking for it. You are. They see this. See you. Honestly, it was at that time. Well, I was going like, to hear his voice. <laughs> literally, honestly, I, they would probably, they would lose it. This is the thing. If that happened, if they had clocked it, they would lose it. They would. Yeah. Because um, even me, like, uh, what did I do? I shouted out a friend. He's not even a trader. He, uh, I can't, he just did like mindset stuff. Mm-hmm. He was just talking about mindset stuff. And he's my best friend from school. I remember I shouted him out once just saying like, and I don't even have followers at the time, just saying like, oh, you know, he's making content. And they, they, they pulled me up on it. They said, you can't share this. You know, you can't do this. And I said, I said, listen, he's my best friend from school. You're yeah. trying to tell me I can't shout him out or show him love. This seems really off. I can understand you know, if it's a competitor or something, mm. then cool. That makes sense. Yeah, oh, but like trying to say to me, this is how controlling they were, you know. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, bro. Terrible business people. <laughs> terrible business people. But um, Yeah, it's funny enough you talked about like, you know, well, get the car, get the watch. You're, you're going to get more respect. And, um, and and that's what I didn't do. You know, I didn't do that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I focused on building assets. Mm-hmm. You know, I said to myself, okay, you know what? If I can secure roof over my family's... Uh, I provide the food. Language the barrier over here. Hold on. <laughs> roof over their heads. Yeah. You know, then once I'm comfortable, then I'm going to get the watch or get the car or fly first class and all mm. that. But before that, nothing. So, so, so till like, um, I think I got my first Rolex was when I was, uh, I think this was last year, I think. Yeah. Yeah, last year. That's it. 
because at that point we had the house in Canada, we had the homes in Pakistan, and we were already thinking about Dubai. So I said to myself, we have homes. There's nothing more that I need. Mm -hmm. You know, if you truly think about it, right, you have a home. You don't have mortgage. You yeah. don't have rent. You own the home. The only bills you have are like grocery bills or like gas bill. Other than that, all this money is coming in. There's nothing more I need. And then you start to think about that, okay, I can put certain percentage towards investments yep. and certain percentage you can put towards, you know, something luxury or whatever, yep. you know. And um, that's what I did with my car, you know, because uh, uh, last year we did around like $4 million. And then I'm thinking that, okay, can I afford a Ferrari, a $400,000 car? Can I afford one? It's not like I need to get one so I can sell a course or do this. Like, can I afford one? You know, I called my accountant. He's like, well, it's 10%. So, sure. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Came to Dubai and bought the car. <laughs> there you go. How was that though? So, like, do you think of it in that way? Like, okay, here's my income. And then sort of breaking it up into his percentage. I can put towards this percentage you know, here and you know, well, this is tax, this is this. Is Do you break it up in that way? So it's kind of, then that dictates the decision for you. This is the amount I assign to luxury and enjoyment. Well, this is a amount for investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, um, because I've lost money in the past, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and, and like, I come from a fast where, where I've always had money. There have been like small portions of my life where I was broke, mm. you know, so I already knew how to manage money. You know, because w when when we had our sales office, mm -hmm. my rent was like twelve hundred dollars a month. You know, twelve hundred dollars a month. We were already pulling in like fifteen, sixteen thousand a month anyway. So I knew how to manage money. Yeah. You know, so I think that's where it all comes from. Like you know, paying taxes and like you're making sure that certain amounts go to certain places. Like you know, like a safe haven or investment and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it all came from that point. And I think it's very important for people to really educate themselves on money too. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of young guys, they make good money really quick. They don't know how to manage it. Yeah. You know, they buy certain stuff and then they have nothing left and they want to promote something more. They get more money and it's a very devilish cycle. Oh, definitely. You know, so so that's why I never um, on even on my social media or live streams, I never said, hey, to be successful, you need a watch mm. or to be successful, you need a car. That's not what success success is when you can sleep at night knowing that you did the best you could with discipline. Mm -hmm. Definitely. No, definitely. And. You know, is that what kind of gets you as well? So through the day to day, through the times where even if you are successful, there's still challenges that come along. Right. So like yeah. no doubt with, let's say, Magic Keys, for example, in the development, no, no doubt there's probably some failed prototypes. Right. And then know that that can be stressful. There's probably money that has to be spent to develop these things as well and go back to the drawing board. So is it the fact that you are working hard, even with the challenges, you know, day to day, every single day, working hard at something and, as you say, providing for the family? Um, and, you know, living life still, you know, at a very decent level, might not even be luxury, but just decent level, you're still living. Is that the part that is your know, success? That is that the part that gets you through those hard times as well, knowing that I'm still going day by day? Bro, it's all about working smart. Mm. You got to work smart. And um, and I remember when we started Magic Keys, mm. we ordered, a, we ordered, a, we actually didn't even have the product mm. when we made the sales page. We had no product. We just had... Two prototypes, I had one, and my partner in Italy, who was at that time, I think, 18 or 19 years old, oh, wow. he had one. So he coded everything. I was in charge of, like, marketing and showing people and everything. Great guy, right? And um, and uh, we, we made the sales page. Sales page launched up, and then we got, like, you know, like 40 orders, 50 orders. We're like, what the hell? 40, 50 orders? We don't even have the product, <laughs> you know? So so then we have to source the product. Product came and then we started selling it. And, and then I'm thinking that, okay, then a lot of people approached us to say that, hey, we can run paid ads for you. Okay. You know, and I'm like, no, because my whole thing was that whatever business I'm going to launch, it has to start with zero money down. Yeah. That's where you make most profit, zero money down. And I'm like, okay, I have YouTube audience and I have Instagram audience. Mm -hmm. How can I leverage this audience to show them something that has value of course you know so started using on youtube started showing people and there were people who said oh no one's going to use it yeah. but then there were more people who said that we will use it yeah. you know so anything in business the um the trick 
is to find the people who have the same wavelengths as you. Yeah. You know, because if you like something, there are a million people who like the same thing. You just got to find them. Mm -hmm. You know, and then once we uh, started, I mean, funny thing, um, in 2019 or 2020, I paid $70,000 in commissions to wow. Vantage FX. Okay. By trading. Mm -hmm. You know, start to think about it. I'm like, think about, okay, you know what? If I have my own platform, I would have paid maybe 30000 because then you're um, buying liquidity at wholesale, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's where we started Dominion Markets. And then I'm like, okay, how can we grow the client base? You know, and then we start to think about, you know, pr now, no broker does this ever, you know? So I looked at the industry. I'm like, okay, you got big guys like IC Markets, Vantage FX, Pepperstone, whatever, Yuga FX, you name it, mm -hmm. you know? And the only thing they say is that, oh, we have the best spreads, best leverage, you know, like low commissions, blah, blah, blah. Same thing. How could we be different? You know, and this is not to show like, you know, how big we did or whatever. This is just to show like, you know, the, the strategy we use that, okay, what can we give more? We had magic keys and we had market fluidity, hmm. right? We're like, okay, anyone who trades on Dominion Markets, you're going to pay commissions just like any other platform, yeah. right? But you can use your commissions to get magic keys for free. Mm. you're paying commissions anyway trading environment is the same you know you can use your commissions to get education market fluidity so i think that drove a lot of people so i think in about uh, in april it's going to be two years we're up to about like 60 70 000 live clients now wow unbelievable We're only because of thinking what more can we give to clients yeah so like when it came to both like uh, let's start with magic keys because that's innovation Right, it's yeah. innovation. Like I said it to someone else. I did an interview with uh, uh, Brian because they're looking at doing a sort of a, a journal, right? Uh, automated journal. So you just have to input the account details and then you just put the screenshots. So you know, a lot of people don't journal. They don't find it very tedious. Automated. Again, innovation. Right? There's a problem. So like even with uh, trading wise, trading from the phone, mm. working out the lot size, sometimes the speed of the trade you miss out. Uh, working out the commission, etc. There's a problem. So how was it, you know, going through that process of, okay, here we have, how can we create a solution, right? Was it where you kind of just, you know, with your partner as well, like work out, okay, here's a solution that we can put together. And no doubt there was obviously, you know, the, the coding aspect, as you said, but how was it for you? Like, no, was it a really great feeling saying, hey, we've got this product that can really help traders, you know, really help them in a, in a massive way, especially with today's uh, sort of styles that we're seeing, obviously lower timeframes and yeah. scalping. It, needs, it requires speed. Yeah. And at that speed, if you don't have the proper risk management, uh, at the end of the day, it can be very dangerous. You know? Or you can miss opportunities as well. So therefore, you're not making the money that you can make. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it was basically um, my buddy. Mm -hmm. He works at a hedge fund mm -hmm. in Switzerland. And uh, they have the Bloomberg terminal and they have this Bloomberg keyboard. Mm -hmm. You know, on that Bloomberg keyboard, they have hotkeys, you know, buy, sell, close half, open, close, like whatever the function is there. Are. And I start to think, why can't we have the same thing for MetaTrader? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I started to think, OK, if I had this thing for MetaTrader, I'd 100 percent use it, you know, because you click open trade and trade opens on the screen. You're like, this is magic. You know, <laughs> if you want to close half on MetaTrader, you got to right click and then click close half or you get a script. You got to move your mouse into that. Yeah. And if, I can, if I can do it with the press of a button, that's magic. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's where the whole idea came from, you know, and um, I posted on my Instagram. I'm looking for some programmers to do this, blah, blah. Like a lot of people, they had the wrong approach. They approached me saying, oh, we're going to charge you this much to do, do, do this for you. Yeah. Then there was this one kid from Italy. He's grown now. The, he from Italy. He sent me a picture of a magic key. What was like a like calculator? Tool. Yeah. With like a like a uh, like buttons on it, like TP close half close. I'm like, wow, this is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, and we started talking, and then we started like you know say like, okay, you know, I, I want to do this. The like we want to take this to full throttle. Mm. You know, at that time he was in university. I'm like, hey, you got to make a choice. Either you do this with me, <laughs> if it doesn't work, you, you put can it go on back him. to university. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, listen, if you don't fuck me over, you're going to make a lot of money with this. This mm -hmm. is going to do really, really well. And Alhamdulillah, bro, like it went really well. Magic keys, it just, 
changed so many things for so many people. Oh, 100%. I've got students who use it as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, they say they can't trade without it, of course. I saw it on the floor too at Where? the office, the oh, Mayfair yeah. office. It was it. Yeah, someone, someone posted wrote. a picture and someone sent it. They're like, bro, magic keys is there. <laughs> and I started, Whoa. I'm telling you, you see some people sm- <laughs> smuggle it in, man. It yeah. doesn't surprise me, honestly, because at, at the end of the day, again, it's a great tool, honestly. Yeah. And I know there are like other iterations who probably copied it since, but the original, you know, in my opinion, is the original. I know you have a digital version as well, mm. right? Yeah, it's incredible, honestly. But um, you know why we launched it? Digital version hmm. because there were people who couldn't afford the physical version, okay, yeah, yeah. which was like $150. Mm. So we're like, okay, let's launch a digital version, 30 bucks, you know, and from that, people will be able to manage risk. Once you're managing risk, you're losing less, which means you have more money. Mm-hmm. And then a point will come where they will have enough money to buy the physical version. But here's the kicker you're not going to buy the physical version for full 150 you buy for 120 mm. because you already have the $30 one. There you go, yeah. So that was like, okay, we could probably do this business strategy and see if it works. And it works. Like a lot of pe- people who buy the digital one, eventually the, they upgrade to the physical one. It's incredible, honestly. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show that you listen to the audience, yeah. right? And uh, it's a big thing because a lot of people who get into trading, I get so many messages from third world countries, right? Where income wise, they physically can't increase their income to massive amounts. Right. Unless they some are obviously starting to, as you said, online business, learning certain online skills, not trading in particular, where they can then outsource on like Fiverr and and offer certain services to increase income. But in terms of like a nine to five and and, and grinding out a job, the income is capped to like two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars a month max. Even then, that's probably high. Um, So then being able to cater because I get a lot like, you know, education wise, like I can't afford education. I only make two hundred dollars. I can't afford to pay, say, a hundred pounds per month. Yeah, that's true. Right. So same with you. Like you've made something that's thirty dollars. I said that it's affordable to everyone. And then you know, showing that you care in terms of if you then get the next product, we just take it off. Right. A lot of people wouldn't do that. They'll just be like, pay the full price for the next one as well. So it's really great to see. And as you mentioned, in terms of like kind of interlooping those all those products there, uh, again, as you say, it is not something that people do because at the end of the day, brokers. They say you need to be educated, but they don't. They won't ever say here's some education, right? I think sometimes they do some free webinars and stuff with yeah. someone who probably doesn't know what they're doing. They're not basically that education. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's I've just like here's them. some lines. Here's some lines. Yeah. Uh, or normally it's indicators, isn't it? It's an yeah. easier one to use. But yeah, in terms of like uh, the brokerage, mm. right? Do you? I'm sure you get it a lot. You know, are you trade on your own brokerage, right? Yeah. But as you've already explained there. <laughs> At the end of the day, if you're going to use a broker, so, so far I haven't partnered with anyone, right? Yeah. I get a lot of offers, I get a lot of emails saying like, you know, promote this brokerage or this prop mm. firm or you know, even random stuff like games or stuff, stuff like yeah. that, right? And I just haven't done it yet, but I'm not opposed to doing it because at the end of the day, I already like refer to prop, certain prop firms, right? Just naturally, because it's like, I know these ones are good, I've used them, et cetera. And uh, I don't like officially say, ah, it's a sponsor of this podcast or anything like that. But it's like, um, I'm not opposed to it because at the end of the day, if I'm already referring people there or if I'm already using something, at the end of the day, why would I not want to benefit from it if yeah. there's a benefit there? So like you said, you're already paying Vantage Broker 70K, right? In, in swaps and spreads and commissions. So if I do it yourself, you save, just for yourself, you would save 30K. That alone, yeah. I'm guessing the benefits. So, you know, and then business-wise, if you're going to, you're going to have so many audience-wise and, and uh, students-wise, you're going to have so many people asking you, what broker should I go to? If you know I could start a broker and I can know that they'll get good commissions, good spreads, um, and obviously the setup will be in their favor, why wouldn't I refer them there? Where then also I would benefit from whatever commissions, charges, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so when you hear people saying like, oh, you trade on your own broker, what, <laughs> what are your thoughts in terms of? I'm just like, I save money that way. Mm. I save money that way. If I trade on my own platform, I'm trading on it. You know, I'm saving money on that way. I'm getting withdrawals on that way. Then, you know, guys say, oh, you know, it's probably like B book and A book. And um, the reason we started to incorporate education mm-hmm. was so that people can be better traders, right? Because Magic Keys has produced thousands of profitable traders who've done really well on funding programs and stuff like this. So we're like, okay, you know what? Once 
you're an educated trader, mm -hmm. you're a profitable trader. And a profitable trader is the biggest asset to a brokerage. Mm -hmm. You know, because they stay there longer, they trade longer, eventually they trade bigger, mm -hmm. which generates more commissions in profits, right? On a B-Book side, you're basically like, you know, all the losses are profits of brokerage. So it's against their best interest for you to be a profitable trader. So we're like, okay, like, you know what? Everything's A, you know, you're getting education because Here's the thing, right? There's a there's a very high turnover rate in the brokerage industry. Mm -hmm. You know, you get the client saying, client goes to their broker A, they lose money over there. They're like, oh, the broker did this. This is, I lose money. Let me go to another broker. They go yeah. to another broker. They start broker jumping, like mentor hopping too, right? Yeah. So we're like, okay, we want to focus on making sure people are profitable. Mm. You know, because if someone's profitable, they're going to tell 10 of their friends that I'm profitable on this brokerage because, hey, maybe I got education. Mm -hmm. And then those 10 will come over to us. You know, they get education, they get profitable. You know, so so my whole thought is long-term business. Mm. You know, that's what I've always done. So when guys say, oh, like, you know, you trade on brokerage and whatever, I've been trading on Vantage FX. I've been trading on IC markets, making money, you know, and to be honest, to start a brokerage, we had to put down around 500,000 in liquidity, you know, because if you're going to have customer deposits come in, you have to match those deposits. Mm. You know, if you got people coming in with 500,000, you need to put money in liquidity, you know? So if you put money in liquidity, then you have a total A side running 100%. Yeah. You know, so, so I mean, that was the whole reason. It, it was a huge investment. But I think it paid off after like six, seven months. We came into profits after that. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like I said, it's uh, entrepreneurship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's what everyone talks about. Everyone always it's, talks about having a business. Yeah. Um, and not just, well, well, technically, a lot of people, unfortunately, they, I would say, unfortunately, they only think about trading. But in terms of trading, there's no guarantee of income, right? You could be the greatest trader in the world and there's no guarantee. You can never say, I'm going to make 100K this month. Mm. You could say it, but the reality is very different. So the reality of having, as you've already said, talked about, actually, to be fair, is that having those income streams in and being you know, in business helps the trading, takes the edge off, right? Suddenly trading can just do what it needs to do in terms of yeah. you turn up and you follow your edge day to day. That's it. Whatever the income is, the income is. And then you have these other income streams, whether it's a business, whether it's a job, high paying job that is covering things, right? And and covering the necessities, if you will. Yeah. And yet when people hear of, oh, you have a broker or oh, you sell uh, education or you sell magic keys, what people don't understand is when you do it at a high level like you do and you do it in with the right intention, it takes a lot of effort and time, right? It takes a lot. So like even um, like you don't need to do boot camps, right? Mm. You don't have to do them, but you know they're beneficial. I you, break even on all my boot camps. I can imagine. Dinners, flights, it's all bre breaky. <laughs> no, I get it because honestly, we did the same. We did a meetup here. Yeah, and it actually cost us money to do a meetup here because we yeah. did all sorts of meals and, and activities and flew even flew out students. Oh, okay, right? interesting. And uh, we're terrible business people in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we, I say it all the time, like we, we are terrible business people in that sense. But when you do things in the right intention, you actually care about people's uh, sort of growth and, and uh, giving them opportunity as well. And, and especially like a lot of people have goals of Dubai. So to be able to show them this is Dubai, this is what it is. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's necessary, you yeah. know. And people just don't understand the work rate that goes into, like, yeah, you might see, people just see like, oh, he's making money that way. But they don't realize that the amount of work that goes into making money that way, we, we damn well better be making money that way because it won't be worth all this effort. Exactly. Right? And, our, and, and our wives would be killing us <laughs> if we're put, spending all this time away, putting all this effort in and we're not bringing anything home whatsoever. Um, it's all about intention. That's why yeah. I always say, like, if your intention is not pure, um, you know, no matter what you do, you know, whether education, whatever business even, or any endeavor, it will never have longevity, right? That's true. And, you know, you might get a reward for a certain amount of time, but it won't last long. It won't be, in, and plus things will probably come back to bite you anyway. While if you do things with the right intention, you might start off slow, yeah. right? You might start off with loss, even like you said there with the, with the brokerage, you didn't see anything for six, seven months, but because the intention was there, and I don't know, did you ever do like, uh, I think obviously you would promote it yourself, but did you ever do like IBs with people? Or was it just purely yourself, word of mouth? No, no. Uh, but we're doing, what what we're doing right now is we're doing IBs with influencers, mm. right? So we're, we're, we're giving them above market rate. Mm -hmm. In exchange, what they can also do is they can have their course on the website okay. that if any random client wishes to buy their course, they can get their course from the commissions they pay to Dominion Markets. Mm. And then, like, you know, once they do that, then the, 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 that uh, influencer or educator, they get the payment from us. Okay. Yeah, so 
like you know different way to like you know grow the business something that's never been done before like that too it's very true no, yeah it's very true and so i'm always thinking what's something new i can do that people would say what the hell is he doing <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah well you no know, no definitely and uh, you know like i said in terms of well what the hell is he doing you know yeah. src smart SRC. roger concepts so, like what well, what was the sort of thought process behind that i loved it when i saw it i was like <laughs> i said roger's a genius honestly it started from that's, smart money concepts that's it i know <laughs> i know yeah but honestly literally I was, when i saw that on twitter i was like this guy's a genius like he <laughs> knows what he's doing and uh you know it makes me laugh as well like that uh, started as a joke too mm. smart roger concepts started as a total joke and now it's like a mini brand at this point we're still exactly. trying to grow that yeah, yeah no i love it honestly and then like you know it starts as a joke but as i said the best things always do yeah and at the end of the day you know there's such a hype like what are your thoughts on smart money concepts like obviously this you know at one point you know the you know clean charts and no indicators was the big mm. thing and then you know another point it's uh you know it's a fibonacci for example yeah. another point it's uh, now it's obviously smart money i think next it's like algorithmic trading is the next one that's going to come along but yeah uh, what are your thoughts on smart money or, and trading you know different strategies as a whole what are your thoughts in terms of like you know, people who trade different ways some people may not like what i say it's all false mm-hmm. it's all false trust me. because because i haven't seen any results mm-hmm. i haven't seen any my fx book links i haven't seen any transactions mm-hmm. no i haven't seen any like you know uh broker reports nothing absolutely nothing all i've seen like i've really digged into this cult mm-hmm. you know and there's nothing the only thing there is there's like these smart money concept signal groups mm. that's all where there is you know there's no reports there's no legitimate like you know results or whatever nothing you know and um, i've been trading the same way i've been trading for the past seven years you know just clean charts candlesticks that's it grew year after year after year and if you if you really look at social media now mm. all the influencers that have like cars and watches and whatnot you'll see that they moved from Fibonacci's to EMAs to RSI, whatever, and now they finally moved to clean charts. Mm. So they've never stuck to just one thing long enough to see if it even works. Mm. You know, so I've uh, like, smart me concept, man, God bless you guys who are still finding, who still trust it and you still like, you know, running towards that light at mm. the end of the tunnel that doesn't exist. All power to you. <laughs> you know, but but in my case, I know that the banks and the institutions, they don't want you to make money. They don't want money going into the hands of the retail traders. Right. And it's absolutely insane to even think about that. The bank is going to tell you this is where we're trading. Institution <laughs> is going to tell you that, oh, we're buying gold at eighteen hundred. All you retard SMC traders can just buy gold here. <laughs> it's just absolute insane. So in terms of like it being false, do yeah. you mean the narrative of like this is how the banks trade? And this is like that so whole idea is just, that whole idea. Yeah. So in terms of like, for example, smart I don't like the terms. I've always hated terms as a whole. But like if someone was to say to me, how do you trade? I would have to say smart money because that's how they would understand it. But in terms of like how I would you know, break it down into the concept, it would be like, you know, structure and uh, uh, was it uh, market sort of rebalancing and stuff like that. I would never describe it as this is how the banks trade or anything. But in terms of someone having an edge using where whether it's you know, the term order blocks or whether it's like uh, discount and premium, which is basically like a pullback and return, yeah. you know, um, but people using these, concepts the actual uh, confluences well, is that fine in terms of the edge are you happy you know in terms of people putting together a story and having a specific edge that's fine is it just more so the narrative of like this is how the banks trade this is the algorithm that runs yeah. uh, the the um, the charts etc see now i the biggest problem i have i've had from the start now i'm not a very smart person you know i'm not good with i would disagree but <laughs> well i'm not good with complicated words mm. you know that's just my ick I'm like, hey, listen, all this like corporate wording and like, I'm just like, just explain it to me in simple terms because 99% of the population, they cannot understand complicated words, mm. you know? So, so um, when they talk about like, you know, um, like impulse premiums or all these terms, these co- to me, they're complicated terms, mm. you know, I don't understand them. Would you say they're like marketable? purposely they're, like make created to market exactly because w- w- when i first started trading i looked into uh like you know these um smc concepts and ict concepts 100 percent. i looked into them but some terms were so difficult to comprehend mm. i was like yeah this is actually very hard for me myself as an individual not anyone else for me 
they're very hard to understand. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to gravitate towards like just watching candles. Because, bro, if you look at a candle, candle either moves up or it moves down. Yeah. You know, our job, is, well, my job as a trader who's done well, I think I've done well. Mm. My job as a trader is just to see where the next 30 minute candle is going to go. Mm. And whether I'm going to use a one cent lot on it or a hundred lot on it, that's up to me. That's it. That's all I want to know. Where the next 30 minute candle is going to go. If I can anticipate where it's going to go, I'm going to make money. That's it. Mm. Nothing imbalanced, nothing about like, you know, moon cycle or this and that. I don't, I don't <laughs> care that. about that stuff. You know, it's all about where the next candle is going to go. And can I accurately predict that every day? That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough in my opinion. And, um, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. The, the candles are the language of the market. Yeah. That's why I say it's like when you learn trading, I always say it's like you're learning a language. You know, so that's why it takes time. You know, just putting everything else to the side in terms of learning the technical side, the charts, that's like learning a language. And the language are the candles, momentum, you know, how they close, etc. So, no, couldn't agree more in that sense. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure you will ruffle a lot of feathers, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. It's good. I think, like, yeah. debate is healthy, and I think there's definitely, there is a cult-like nature it to smart money. It creates competition. Yeah. Healthy competition. Mm -hmm. You know, some people look at it, oh, he's hating. this. No, I'm creating healthy competition. Mm -hmm. That's all what it is. You know, some may not like confronting certain beliefs or ideas, but I, I thrive off of that. Yeah. You know, so. Well, I think it's healthy. At the end of the day, it's healthy. I think that what I always find interesting is, like, when you observe social media, whether it's a trading post or whether it's just a normal, you know, I don't know, like a, a news article, you find all these people arguing with completely complete strangers online <laughs> for ages, like literally comment after comment after comment, like just arguing with each yeah. other. And I just find it crazy because I'm like, where do you get the time? And the energy that takes is yeah. insane, yeah. right? And in trading, is, is completely guilty of it as well. Like you could turn around and put a tweet out saying like, you know, like I said, SMC is false and you will get hundreds and not thousands of people just constantly trying to convince you of your opinion right convince you that you're wrong yeah. instead of just saying like you said healthy competition like just go and prove it then prove that you're you know he's wrong or whatever yeah. it may be and just prove it i think it's a it's a, definitely a fair assessment as you know like like i said if i was to label myself if i had to i'd have to say smart money mm -hmm. right just because that's how in terms of perception people would then be able to say ah oh, he trades this way but i'm happy with it because i i always break it down into people like I had one guy actually recently, he reached out to me, he said, oh, one of my friends, he said he's learning ICT, and that's the algorithm, right? The, 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 there's an algorithm that runs the markets, right? Then he said he had a friend who works at Barclays Bank mm -hmm. in the UK, right? He calls, you know, and he spoke to this guy, and the guy at Barclays Bank said, we don't use TradingView, you know, and we use, um, there's another one, I can't remember the name of it, but he had another, another different terminal, um, and they literally use, um, what are those candlesticks called? They're not, they're... Um, Bar charts? Uh, no, no, no. D the other one, the really funky one, it's like volume based. Oh, Rishmi, um, uh, Ren Renko. Yeah, yeah. So they use that. He goes, but then he's like, he was conflicted. He goes, but ICT is saying this and it's an <laughs> algorithm, right? And then, but this guy who works at a bank is saying that they're using these volume charts. And I said, listen, no one knows. This is the thing. No one knows, right? No, there's an algorithm, uh, whether it's technicals or fundamentals or you know, uh, support resistance. No one knows. All that matters is you have an edge, right? Yeah. And you stick, as you said earlier, kind of like stick to one pair, uh, this number of trades. Like when you have an edge and you just focus on that every day, that's all you have to care about. Yeah. Never give in to a narrative. It doesn't and matter who don't it is. argue with people. <laughs> that's it. If you that's have it. an edge, it's working for you. You make money. That's all you need to know. That's it. That's and don't try and change it. You know, like that's, yeah. I think a big thing that people do, unfortunately, is that they will have something that's working for them or starting to work for them. Mm. Then they'll say, oh my God, this guy just showed a, a one to 10 risk to reward or this guy showed 100K or the, and then bang, as you said, they're, they're hopping around and then straight away, just as they were about to do it, they were about to get their progress. They cut like, they basically destroy their foundation and have to rebuild yeah. again. Um, but in terms of like, you've been doing this a long time now, right? You've been teaching for a while as well. What were the common mistakes that you've seen uh, traders? I think I actually know, I've, I've heard your answer before. It's very, it's, it's very blunt and it's real, it's short in terms of the, you know, one pair, one time and uh, one or two trades. Right. Yeah, that's it. Like uh, just just one, two trades a day. It's very simple. I'm a very simple guy. I don't complicate things. Just one or two trades a day. Mm. That's all what's going to work. The more you complicate it, the more you look into some, you know, like I have guys say, oh, man, like I've, I've tried meditation. I've tried <laughs> yoga. That's not going to help you. <laughs> that's not going to stop you from not taking 10 trades a day. Mm. You know, like no meditation is going to help you with that. Some guys say, oh, trading in a, like 
even Mark Douglas, is that? Yeah, that's his name. Yeah. Yeah. He also talks about, you know, discipline, this and that, but he also talks about like one or two trades a day. Yeah. You know, that's it. everything else that they talk about, like meditation, this and that. You got to, you got to uh, tap into your inner superhero and whatnot. <laughs> that's all BS. You know, I don't yeah. believe in those things. You know, I'm a very logical person and logic dictates if you take, because here's the thing, a human can only make two emotional decisions in a day. Rational, emotional. Mm-hmm. So whenever you're trading money, that's basically an emotional decision because our emotions are tied to real money. You know, so if you can only make like two emotional decisions with money in a day, that's it. Yeah. As soon as you venture off into your third trade and the fourth trade, that's when like you, know, you start to slide down a slippery, uh, like a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, no, definitely. And uh, I couldn't agree more. I think we're literally coming towards the end, so we're gonna. I'm going to quick fire you a couple questions, right? Michael's probably looking at the time and like, oh. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we can stay all, all right. night. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to quick fire you a couple questions, okay. right? So one, you spoke about recently, mm. uh, which is a big thing in our culture, which is evil eye. Yes. Right? Evil eye. So my opinion that I've always had right, when it came to evil eye, one is like, not that I don't believe in it, but it's like, if I don't give energy towards that, mm. I'm not going to overthink things. I'm not going to start, you know, sh- sort of giving excuses. Like, oh, this was evil eye or this was that. Um, Again, sort of intention. For me, it's like, as long as I keep my intention, I do my thing. Yeah, I'm not flaunting. I'm not being overly uh, greedy or anything. I'm just living my life, right? And the intention is fine. And I'm doing it in a very sustainable manner. Everything's good. Wherever, after that, you know, if bad things happen or whatever, it's out of my, out of my control. Challenges will always come. But what are your thoughts? Because obviously, I, I I remember you said, yeah, I think it was the car. Or yeah. I think it was the car. And people were saying to you, like, oh, be careful, Raja. You know, da, da, da. Like, what are your thoughts on it? I think evil eye, it... it it, it exists if mm. you think it exists, right? Mm. To me, anything that happens, negative or positive, there's a, there's a logical reason behind it. You know, you get into an accident, and maybe someone who hit you, he wasn't driving right, he hit you. You know, he hit you. I mean, that's all what it is. So, I mean, whenever something bad happens, there's always a logical reason behind it. Mm. And I also think that, you know, the more you think about the negative, the more that negative is going to happen to you. Yeah. You know, because you're constantly thinking about it. And that's law of attraction. If you don't think about it, it's whatever. It's fine. And when people say, oh, you know, don't show this, don't do that, evil eye. I'm like, what about evil eye with Elon Musk? What about evil eye with Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates? I mean, Bill Gates is at the time where he's probably going to expire. Who, who, who knows when? Mm. You know, what about there's no evil eye there. There's no evil eye with Shah Rukh Khan or, or Tom Cruise. He looks, He still looks like he's in his... Late 30s. <laughs> you know, there's no evil eye there. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Right? So I think evil eye only exists in the average minds. That's where evil eye exists. In mm. the population that's controlled by the governments, that's controlled with their own limiting beliefs, mm. that's where evil eye exists because they believe in it. You know, if you look at the high achievers, the high performers, mm. there's no evil eye there. You saying both. Conor McGregor. Where's the evil eye? I don't see that over there. It's always based on their actions. So let's say Conor yeah. McGregor as an example, right? Like he's still hyper successful, yeah. But yeah, he had you know a period of time where he lacked discipline, and therefore you know did some really crazy things because of the lack of discipline. Lack of discipline, right? So it's not really evil eye that's caused that. If someone wanted to say that, it's more so he changed something, right? He was disciplined, it created the success, and reason why he had this negativity or negative press and negative situations was simply because of the lack of discipline, and therefore changed something. Something changed in the, in the behavior. Um, and yeah, I can agree more. That's a very similar sort of thought process. Mm. Uh, next one for you is in terms of the partner. So obviously you've been through this journey, you know, and as you said already, we've already talked about the partner really helped to sort of step things up in terms of being accountable and responsible for another person. Uh, but in terms of success, I've always believed and I had the sort of impression of, you know, but next to every great man is, a, is obviously a great woman in terms of, I don't know what it is, whether it's support or whether it's just, you know, advice, but what are your thoughts in terms of having that partner? Because I know you're a very private person in the family mm. side, because obviously nothing on socials, which we can talk about. But it's a very, uh, which is interesting though, because obviously you are on socials at quite a high level. Um, you know, do you ever struggle with people coming up to you and you're with your family and stuff? And is that no, ever a problem? Or is I'm not that famous yet. <laughs> yeah, there, man. Sometimes, I'm you, like especially like, here, I'd imagine. Dubai Mall. It happened um, yeah. this morning. I was driving and uh, and uh, some guy basically started waving at me. So I rolled down the window. He's like, Roger Banks, Roger Banks. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you recognize me? He's like, your car. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, yeah, I think a partner, 
It's very important. Very important. Like, like you know, my wife, I mean, she supports me in everything. Mm-hmm. In everything that I do, she's, she's like, just good. Even if I think that I shouldn't do it because of whatever reason, she's like, no, just do it. Mm. Just do it. Because I think she's been with me through the whole journey, you know, and she's seen how I operate. If I think about something, I got to do it, I do it. But sometimes I have this some sort of resentment that I don't want to do it, she pushes me. No, you got to do it. You've mm-hmm. done so well. You've done this. You've done that. Do this. If you fail, so what? What's going to happen? Nothing. So uh, I think having an amazing partner in your life can make a huge difference. Main thing is sh- sh- they keep you grounded. Yeah. You know, that's the I mean. They keep you grounded. They keep you humble. And then, like, you know, once you start a family, you got kids, that's just a cherry on top. Yeah. It's a challenge, no doubt. But oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely is. It's, it's something that yeah. changes your perspective. Yeah. And I think obviously this day and age, and especially as you say about Western society as well, you know, being what it is now, it doesn't promote family. You know, it doesn't mm. promote, you know, having the one partner and, and the, the, the wife that you're loyal to and, and having the kids. Unfortunately, it's very much trying to separate the family, uh, which I think is causing a lot of the issues that we have nowadays, especially with me- men's mental health, for example. Yeah. Because they're not grounded anymore, as you say. Yeah. And they're, they're kind of lost and there's a lot of different perceptions and pressures that are being perpetrated on them of how you should be. And it's very interesting. But in terms of discipline, so you talked about, you know, meditation and, and um, what was it, yoga, you know, yeah. impacting. But I'm a big advocate in saying that obviously as a disciplined person, it, it won't change the results because it's all about you deciding to obviously you know, be a certain way and discipline towards your trading. But I do say it helps to be a disciplined person, right? So I know you work out, but would you say being disciplined in your everyday life, so whether it's working out, dieting uh whatever it may be something that's hard but you have to do it anyway mm. does would you say that is beneficial and, and can help to obviously showing discipline towards trading as well or would you say no it's two separate things no it helps a lot mm-hmm. like having a routine having a disciplined life it helps a lot it goes in every other way like my whole day mm-hmm. is a ritual mm-hmm. you know i have everything planned to the t i wake up I'm going to go to the gym at the same time every day. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'll come home. I'll have the same breakfast (laughs) every day. Five eggs, toast with peanut butter and coffee with honey. Same breakfast. Then I'm going to pick up my son from school. And then, like, you know, the day starts. So, like, you know, then the New York session opens in Pakistan. So, we do that. Then we have uh, to deal with the customer support for Romanian markets Mm -hmm. at nighttime for me. And the next day starts the same routine. I don't deviate from my routine. And if you look at every high achiever, they have a routine. Yep. If you don't have routine in your life, whatever you're trying to do or accomplish, you're never going to be able to get there. You know, there's going to be a lot of roadblocks, but you're not going to get there just as you thought you would. Yeah. Because your other part of life has no structure. There's no routine. So for me, it's ex- even now, bro, this morning I went to the gym. Yep. Yesterday I landed at 3 a.m. in the morning. I woke up at 8.30. After like three hours of sleep, I went straight to the gym. Because I have to do it. Definitely. I think if I mess up one of my routines, it's going to affect the way I conduct my business. It's going to affect the way I conduct my trades and all that. So it's, for me, it's very, very important. Definitely. I couldn't agree more. And I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I yeah. didn't want to have another like ruffled feathers. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> not again. No, I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I love it. Oh, what's he going to say now? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. I love it, though. I love it. Um, but I think, I think that's a good place to wrap up, man, honestly. Yeah. And uh, again, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to come down. And I know that you know it wasn't probably easy. And I know we, we almost missed it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I would have been sad, but I would have. You know, I, would, I know again, right intention, literally what we've been talking about, mm-hmm. a very key part of the podcast. Right intention, I knew it would happen eventually. Yes. And again, though, a, a huge thank you for uh, coming on, and, and no doubt a lot of value for a lot of people out there who can take yeah, some man, things away. Yeah, man. Thank you. Very humble you invited me. Thank you. No, uh, hopefully, again, we'll do one again yeah. in the future. But I will put in the. Uh, in the description, obviously, you know, the links to everything. Um, so it'll all be there. And make sure you check that out. And again, thank you. And till next time, catch you on the next episode.